Good evening, everyone, and thank you for joining us for our January the 18th regular council meeting. As we do at the start of each meeting, we have a short moment of private contemplation. So please join me. Thank you, everyone. So I'll call this meeting to order at 7.01 p.m. So item two, adoption of agenda. So the recommendation is that the regular council agenda dated January the 18th, 2022 be adopted as printed. A mover and a seconder for this. Councillor Scott, Councillor Dykey, any additions or comments? Seeing none, I'll call for the vote. All those in favor? Any opposed? And it is carried. At this time, Council, you may declare any pecuniary interest in the general nature thereof. Seeing none, we'll move on. Uh, there's no presentations or deputations in the council meeting. There will be in the committee of the whole meeting. So we'll move on to open forum. So I'll ask our clerk if anybody has signed up for open forum. Uh, no, Your Worship, there is no submissions today for open forum. Okay, thank you. So we'll move on to item seven, adoption of minutes. And it's the adoption of council minutes, recommendation that the minutes of the regular council meeting dated December the 21st, 2021 be adopted as printed. A mover and a seconder for this. Councillor Contois, Councillor Orr, any comments or questions? Seeing none, I'll call for the vote. All those in favor? Any opposed? And it is carried. So we'll move on to correspondence, 8.1. Correspondence for action, and it's contact community services, and they are requesting for a street naming rights. So the recommendation that we have is the council requests that staff report back with a program for auctioning new street names as a fundraising effort for contact community services. Can I have a mover and a seconder to get this on the floor? Deputy Mayor LaDuc, Councillor Dykey. Comments or questions? Uh, Councillor Lamb. Yes, uh, when I read it, I'm, you know, I had some some positive thoughts about it, but I'm not going to support this. Uh, we're looking uh, at uh, different. Uh, uh, we have uh, things further along in the uh, in the agenda with regards to those types of things, maybe, and also we have uh, many, many, many uh, um, local families and such that uh, we haven't recognized yet. Um, yes, we've got lots of uh, name in the 1800s and the 1900s, but uh, uh, early 1900s, but I, I'm not seeing uh, as much from people that contributed to this community uh, in the 60s, 70s, and 80s, and such like that, and uh, that started businesses here that employ people um, and uh, are just as much town builders as people were in 1830. So I would rather look at it from that perspective. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Councillor Lamb. Councillor Ferragini. Thank you, Worship. Uh, I have no problem supporting this. I was uh, through the LSRCA, uh, Aurora actually put up a town street name where they raised money for that. Um, and it was, uh, I believe it was a, a live bid. This is going back quite a few years ago, but I think they did a live bid on it and it raised over $10,000 to the event that was happening. Um, as long as when the person, uh, if somebody wanted to do some sort of auction, there was some sort of threshold, and you know the the name that was being used was tasteful it was within the right rules and such i don't see an issue with it we're going to have many streets that keep coming up uh in this town i get what councillor lamb is saying definitely uh there are names that should be recognized on our streets but we also do have streets like uh tiger tail and uh, summerlin and there's you know like 
Not that there's anything wrong with those streets whatsoever. The subdivisions do get put up with different names. So I don't see an issue with using this as a fundraiser uh, for the right reasons. Thank you, Councillor Ferragini. Councillor Orr. Thank you, Your Worship. Um, my understanding is that if someone bids to put a name in, that that name just goes on the list of names from what I understand. And it would be up to council then to decide whenever or if ever it goes in. So um, I don't I don't have a problem with it if 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 it goes on to a potential list for the future. I don't see that uh, there maybe would be a problem. I understand where Councillor Lamb's coming from. And yes, there is lots of uh, people that uh, should be recognized. But uh, if this is a case for uh, um, for them to raise a little money and that name just go on our list of potential street names, uh, I, I don't see the harm in that. Okay, Councillor Cantor. Yeah, I was I was reading this over there, and you're absolutely right, uh, Ron. Um, everything I read here, it, it, they have to go to the bottom. They put them on our list, and they have to meet the criteria. And they're asking for three streets to raise money for support. Um, Contact is uh, uh, trying to do their best and and, and being innovative. And uh, I don't have a problem with this. Um, I think it's a great idea. Um, so I will support this. Okay, thank you. Other comments? Uh, Councillor Dakey. Well, if we can raise some money from three streets, that's great. But I know, uh, as Gary was saying, we have a lot of families and, and a lot of deep roots that we got to uh, not forget and continue to bring these names and families for, forward. So so I, I have no issue with doing three streets and uh, and I'm open-minded to that if they can raise some money. But but we have to continue to, to uh, review our uh, names of our families and our roots uh, for the streets in the future. Okay, Councillor Sandu. Thank you, Your Worship. Uh, I don't have a problem supporting this as it's written, but the way the recommendation is, it's asking for our staff to report back um, with a program for auctioning. Um, I, I don't think we're deciding on this. We're just giving direction to staff to come back and say how it can be done. And, and for that recommendation, I don't have an issue. Thank you, uh, Councillor Ferragini. Yes, thank you, Councillor Sandu. I was gonna point that out as well as the fact um, with staff bringing it forward in the letter, they request up to three street names. I mean, having a street name is a pretty big deal and, and it should be able to auction for quite a bit of money. So if staff come back and say, hey, you know what? One street name is a great idea to raise some good money for this. So be it, right? We have to see how staff comes back with it. Yes, and I agree that I think we do need a staff report to come back just with uh, some of the intricacies of the uh, of the program that whether we could work with a, a developer that would uh, <laughs> agree for one of his streets to uh, to be used for a fundraiser or whether it's one of the, the town's uh, lists that uh, we're giving up and uh, I, I, I think if anybody is uh, going to an auction and bidding, uh, I think they would want to see a street named uh, for that, that there, maybe there should be a time frame or something like that, that uh, uh, I'd be afraid there should be more certainty. So uh, I think if, with a staff report, they could delve into this a little bit further and just see, uh, uh, be able to compare how many names that we have on the uh, uh, street registry now that are waiting to uh, be used and, uh, to see whether there's any innovative ways to be able to uh, allow this as a fundraising. Uh, I will just con comment that Contact So Simco is a great organization as far as uh, 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 housing development for our, our area as well as job, uh, job, job locations and job creating. And so that uh, anything we could do to help them, I think it would be money that would go back into our own community so that uh, that's uh, the best part of this, that it'd be a fundraising for a local uh, organization that does do a lot for our, our own town. So 
Any other comments or questions? But uh, I do have a mover and a seconder for the council requests that staff report back was a program for auctioning new street names as a fundraising effort for contact community services. So with that, I'll call the vote. All those in favor? Any opposed? And it is carried. 8.2, correspondence for action, Association of Ontario Road Supervisors, Joe Coleman, Certified Road Supervisor, Senior Certificate. So the recommendation is the council receive the correspondence from the Association of Ontario Road Supervisors and acknowledge Manager of Transportation, Matthew Joe Coleman, on his achievement of Certified Road Supervisor, Senior cert Certification. Mover and a seconder for this. Councillor Dyke, Councillor Orr, comments or questions? That uh, uh, Terry Foran, I don't know whether you're uh, with us tonight, but uh, comments, Deputy Mayor, do you want to uh, comment on our uh, congratulations to Joe? Yeah, I was just going to say it was a, a great accomplishment by Joe Coleman. I, I, we always love to see our staff increase their professionalism and some of their uh, uh, certificates. So this is a great one. It is by AORS, which is uh, uh, by provincial legislation, exclusive right to use the designation as a certified road supervisor. So it's a great to see Joe moving, uh, advancing himself with his uh, professionalism. So uh, I appreciate his effort. And uh, as you can see, it's working because he was out there for the last couple of days with his staff. And I, I did see him on the road tonight. He was out there working uh, hand in hand with his staff. So a uh, great team effort by everybody. And I'm sure Terry's got some comments to make there because. Uh, it's his team, so hopefully uh, he's doing that. It's a great job that uh, Joe did and uh, a great certificate for him to get. So congratulations, Joe. I wonder, uh, Terry Foran, uh, if you want to comment, that uh, send our congratulations to Joe and thank him for his hard work and especially the, the last two days. That uh, I think that uh, we can be proud with the, the way our roads crew uh, handled the snow and uh, by and large that, uh, yeah, our town looks awfully, awfully good as far as uh, snow clearing. So, Terry? Thank you, Mayor Keffer and um, Deputy Mayor LeDuc. Um, yes, I'd like to um, just acknowledge your comments, but um, uh, Joe is certainly dedicated and uh, stays up on education and current trends. Um, he's, he's very aggressive with it. And of course, um, the support that, uh, that the town offers um, is certainly appreciated, but um, it, it does have a benefit across the organization, obviously. And uh, we take any opportunity we can uh, to, to push uh, folks through these programs. So um, that's really all I have, but uh, I applaud Joe and, and his dedication to continued uh, education and training and certifications. Thank you. Thank you, Terry. Other comments? Councillor Lamb. Yes, uh, Joe Coleman is an integral part of our uh, traffic safety committee. Um, he uh, uh, is wonderful in, uh, in his support for data-driven solutions and, uh, and telling us why we can and why we can't. And, and uh, what uh, what the costs are and what the potential liabilities are, and I certainly uh, really appreciate his professionalism because uh, when you're dealing with um, uh, public complaints, you certainly can have some knee-jerk reactions on behalf of the politicians. But he does uh, he does bring um, um, along with the rest of the professional people on the committee and and uh, my colleagues on the committee. Uh, bring a, a rational point of view to uh, what we're trying to do to uh, ensure uh, safe traffic in this town. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Lamb. Councillor Dyke. I too, I too, just like to congratulate uh, Joe. You know, he's I've seen him um, kind of come through the ranks, and uh, he's done a great job for our municipality. We're very fortunate to have him, and I know he's uh, plays a big part. Uh, in uh, Terry's uh, team, and we are lucky to to have uh, motivated uh, young blood in 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 our uh, in our town, and, uh, and it's good to see that we have the staff um, uh, wants to improve themselves and takes courses and and grow within our, our municipalities because there's a lot of competition for good guys like Joe out there. So thanks, Joe. Okay. Any other comments? Otherwise, Terry, pass on our congratulations and thanks Joe for his hard work. So with that, I'll call for the vote. All those in favor? And it is carried.
So we'll move on to uh, staff reports, item nine, 9.1, report of development and engineering service. So it's a building permit activities report, July the 1st to September the 30th, 2021. And the recommendation is that report DES 2022-07 entitled building permit activity report, July the 1st to September the 30th, 2021, be received for information. Moving a seconder for this, Councillor Sandu, Councillor Contois, Comments or questions? Councillor Sandu. Thank you, Your Worship. Uh, Willie, I just wanted to thank you for the report and also the emails you sent. Um, you know, I really re appreciate that our response time is, is less than um, the prescribed timelines according to the building code. But the key in there is if it's a complete application and full application. Sometimes people tend to forget that if the application comes in half or missing some information, of course, it's going to take longer than, uh, than uh, it's required. But uh, like you said, uh, you know, especially now during COVID, uh, timing is essential, costs are going up. And I want to thank you and your team for, for hitting those timelines and then making the permits out as quick as you can. Thank you. Yes, thank you, uh, Willie, uh, our chief building official, Willie Wong. Uh, Raj had sent uh, questions about uh, timing of uh, getting the applications uh, processed. And as Councillor Sandu said, that uh, you were well within the uh, provincial guidelines. And uh, thank you, Willie, for, for, uh, for the work that your staff does. So I see Councillor Dyke has a question. Councillor Dyke? I just have a similar comments. I know Willie works hard in his department and he has a good uh, team behind him. And I know he'll, there's many more, many years of hard work and challenges ahead of, uh, of his department. But I have just wanted to note that I was in his, in his department, um, I guess uh, maybe right after Christmas. And I, know, I noticed how helpful uh, Willie uh, has, has trained or guided his staff to help the public. And, and this gentleman was out of town. He bought property in Bradford and, and I've observed, I stood there and observed how helpful uh, the customer service was to this uh, new resident and investor in our municipality. And it's, it's nice to see that uh, the good customer service because uh, um, I know everybody works hard and it's, it's paperwork, but it's that interacting and making, making people feel a very important customer service is number one, and I know Willie has uh, has kind of worked to uh, to uh, guide his staff or encourage uh, someone at the front desk to to give the answers. And I was I was very impressed how how uh, what I seen, and uh, and uh, that's it's important to have it on Mr. Pally because it's not to not some people understand all this stuff, but not everybody. It's it's scared they get scared of dealing with some of these applications and in the fees and understanding it. Some are, are pros at it. They do it every day for a living and they understand, but, but for the average person coming in, it's uh, nice to see a helpful hand. That's my comments. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Dyke. Other comments or questions that uh, I guess we'll be waiting for the year end report uh, to just to see how last year's uh, permits uh, uh, compared to the year before. I, I wonder, Willie, uh, could you comment? Uh, we do appear to be on, on par with last year or how, how does it seem to be uh, uh, working out as far as year-to-year uh, -year comparisons? Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, also, I'd like to thank Councillor Sandil, Councillor Daiki, and the rest of the council member for the support. Uh, to answer uh, Mayor Kauf's uh, question, uh, if you look at this year, uh, the third quarter report, I think we are more ICI project compared to last year. That doesn't mean the residents will slow down. I think uh, we have a lot of, uh, for example, Baby Wellington, Grey Gow, uh, Bornhead, you know, also probably coming, probably is uh, very soon. So I can foresee 2022 would be uh, surpassed this year's revenue. Uh, construction will continue busy. Uh, right now, although, you know, uh, we, 
I still have to fill one of the position for my senior inspector, John Moore. It's a, it's a big loss for this town. And he's a great inspector and served this town well. So I hope I can recruit another uh, similar person uh, to serve this town and uh, to keep uh, you know, construction going. Okay. Um, that's all I have to say. Uh, one thing, the last one I want to say, although we have to enforce building code, but like the uh, Council of and Council Daiki say, our staff always try to walk extra mile, try to help the customer to find the uh, option, how to, uh, you know, uh, comply with the building code. So uh, thank you for the council support for the last year. That's all I have to say. Thank you. Thank you, Willie. And uh, yes, right. Uh, John Moore retired at the end of uh, last year, and he certainly will be missed that uh, he had uh, been with the town quite a while. And uh, yeah, his knowledge and uh, his mannerisms went a long way so that uh, he certainly will be missed. And uh, hopefully we can fill that position to uh, with somebody of equal caliber. Any other questions or comments? Seeing none, I'll call for the vote then. All those in favor? Any opposed? Then that is carried. Okay. Thank you, Willie. Good night. So item 9.2, report of community service, line two speed reduction. So the recommendation is that report COM 2022-03 entitled line two speed limit reduction be received and that council approve a 60 kilometer an hour posted limit on line two from the town boundary to County Road 27. A mover and a seconder for this. Councillor Lamb, seconder, Councillor Orr. Comments or questions? That, uh, in the report, well, uh, <laughs> yeah. The town of New Comsa has lowered their speed limit on line two. And uh, because of that, uh, the staff report uh, is asking whether we want to uh, lower our section of line two to 60 kilometers an hour as well. So, Councillor Lamb. Yeah, I don't disagree with this. Uh, we're only talking about a kilometer. We're talking about a, a section of road that has a big curve in it uh, before you get to uh, uh, County Road 27. And also the fact that there is a business there that has uh, trucks and agricultural equipment that come out on that curve. Uh, and I can understand why it was, was lowered by new tech because of the ups and downs in the road uh, between uh, 20 side road and 27. Uh, I think it makes perfect sense and it'll only affect uh, four or five houses of our uh, residents, but it, it, uh, it, and it's not really being used as a bypass any longer, but it just makes sense so that we don't have to sign it differently and enforce it differently. Thank you. Uh, Deputy Mayor. Yeah, I just wanted to jump in and say I concur with uh, Councillor Lamb that I think it's just a, such a small run and because New Tech did it, it only makes sense for us to match that speed limit for that area. I don't really want to see a speed trap or people uh, us having to sign other things to create a slowdown or create a speed up. So uh, I just think it's uh, it's just makes sense for us to do it. And uh, I'm going to support the recommendation that staff written. Uh, I think it's a, something that's very simple to do. And I, uh, I agree with the recommendation. Thank you. Any other comments? <laughs> I was actually leaning the other way. I was thinking that uh, <laughs> it would be good to keep our speed limit at 80. I know in our traffic committee, we get so many requests to, to lower the speed limit. And this wasn't actually from <laughs> residents uh, of our municipality. It was from the town of New Tecumseh, I gather. And uh, the OPP's recommendation for the whole line too really didn't agree with the lowering of to 60. But the OPP's comments were, if they do lower it to 60, then they hoped that Bradford West Goldenberry would lower ours to 60 as well, just so that there wasn't a, a, uh, a different differentiation in, in speed limits. But uh, uh, <clears throat> Council Lamb and the Deputy Mayor make good points. It is a very short stretch and there is a curve there and a business that, that is on the curve that uh, 
I, I wonder whether there's an opportunity to uh, synchronize some of the other speeds of uh, concession roads between New Tecumseh and Bradford. <laughs> I, I, I'm thinking of line seven from uh, the club of Bond Head coming down into uh, <laughs> Bond Head. We've probably looked at this before, Councillor Orr, but uh, there's an awful long stretch of 50 kilometer an hour when the, the speed limit in New Tecumseh is 70. So I don't know whether that would be an opportunity. It is a bit of a speed trap there with no residential uh, uh, driveways for quite a while, but uh, it's... Uh, Something to think about anyways. Uh, I, I think this probably has come before council at, at a certain time. And there probably is a reason that, that it is lowered uh, to 50 for such a long, uh, long stretch. So Councilor Orr, do you uh, <laughs> want to comment about the seventh line? Well, I think anybody that comes from uh, the west to east and comes down that hill uh, hitting that 50, uh, it's a pretty big surprise to, uh, to all of a sudden realize you went to, uh, <laughs> everybody's shaking their head. I'm sure everybody's done that. Uh, yeah, it might be something to look at. I, I don't have a lot of uh, of complaints about it, uh, to be honest. So uh, um, I think if the odd, uh, uh, the police are setting up just on the outskirts of Bond Hill, I'm sure they get quite a few coming up that hill that uh, are uh, are over the limit. But Anyways, that's uh, that's a different uh, topic, I think, that uh, is something for uh, to think of in the future. Uh, Deputy Mayor and then Councilor Lenz. I was just going to suggest if you wanted to, we could request that maybe New Tech drop theirs to 50, because we already have a lot of people complaining in Bond Head about coming through the uh, subdivision <laughs> speeding. So uh, if we want, let's go ask them to drop that to 50, because that uh, we could keep it uh, right through the whole area at 50 kilometers. And I know it would upset a lot, but I, I'll tell you what, it would certainly slow them coming down uh, when they come up uh, up the hill and back into Bond Head. I mean, it would certainly slow it down there. We've had to put speed mitigation th uh, uh, um, things in there, some speed mitigation things in there. So uh, um, I have no problem saying to New Tech, if you'd like to drop that to 50, we'd appreciate that. So, but otherwise, uh, you know, it's a, it's a good one. We'll keep it at 50 there. And I, I, I like I say, the line too, it, you know, when I read the report, I know OPP said no, but uh, uh, the staff were working back to the shoulders were an issue and things like that. And with the curve and like uh, Councillor Lamp said, the business and everything, I, I kind of uh, said, I thought the same thing that it should be uh, 60 consistent with the uh, new tech one so that we didn't create some kind of speed trap for people. Thank you. Okay, hey, thanks, Deputy Mayor. Councillor Lamb, final comment. Yeah, Rob, I agree with you um, because the, uh, in Bond Head, and I know it's not on the topic, but uh, the station is that's the deep uh, double hill there, and you need to have a little bit of speed coming off the hill to get up that 50 into town, and it's 50 the whole stretch, uh, so they should be doing 50 by the top, but if you're driving a school bus or something that can't take a hill like that with a full load on, uh, then I, I think you really need a little bit of headway get going uh, to keep going on the hill and also going down the hill so you can get up the other hill because it's way higher when you get up to the uh, the new Tecumseh side there. So uh, it's an unusual road and uh, sometimes you just need a little bit of help. So I think uh, 50 could be 60 pretty easy till, uh, till a couple of hundred meters before uh, Bond Head. Okay, so we've had a, <laughs> an expanded discussion so that, uh, uh, but the uh, recommendation before us is to uh, lower the speed limit on line two to 60 kilometers an hour. So with that, I'll call for the vote. All those in favor? Any opposed? And it is carried. So with that, we'll move on to item 10, request for staff report. Is there any request for a staff report? Seeing none. So then we'll move on to into Committee of the Whole. So the recommendation is that Council resolve itself into Committee of the Whole to consider matters on the Committee of the Whole agenda dated January the 18th, 2022. A mover and a seconder for this. Councilor Perugini, Councilor Scott, all in favor? And it is carried. So I'll pass it over to Deputy Mayor LaDuke to uh, consider the Committee of the Whole meeting. James? Thank you, Worship. I don't think we need a break, so we'll just carry right on through, if you don't mind. 
So uh, I'll call the meeting to order at 7.30. Uh, adoption of the agenda, recommendation that the Committee of Whole agenda dated uh, January 18th, 2022 be adopted as printed. May I get a movement or seconder for this? Move by Councillor Deggy, second by Councillor Scott. Questions or concerns with the printed version? Seeing none, all in favor? Carried, thank you. Uh, declaration of beginner interest in the general nature, you can declare an hour when the issue comes up. At this point in time, I'm seeing none, we'll move on. So we have our staff report 4.1 fire, uh, a report of fire emergency services, fire consolidation assessment, Burnsville and rescue service uh, and Bradford was going to be fire emergency service. So I have a presentation by Mohammed and Nevit, uh, Vernus and Young. Uh, so if we can just turn it over to them, I will uh, invite them. They're in here, they're in the window. So I'll turn it over to whoever wants to take the uh, meeting from here. Good evening, gentlemen. Good evening. Thank you very much, uh, Chair. Um, do we have our presentation ready to go? There we go. Perfect. Oh, just, uh, just one moment here. Okay, perfect. Good evening, Mayor and Councillors, and thank you for inviting us to present to you this evening. My name is Mohammed Bamani, and I'm an associate partner at EY Canada, and I lead our municipal government practice nationally. I'm joined here today by my colleague, Navneet Vallat, who is a manager in our government and public sector consulting practice and leads many of our municipal government engagements. Next slide, please. We are, of course, here to discuss the results of our assessment into the possible consolidation of fire services between the towns of Bradford and Innisfil with particular focus on feasibility. Our assessment included the following components that you will see on this slide. An understanding of the financial impact analysis on capital and operating expenditures and revenue, the operational impact on things such as response times and fire attack assembly to identify what gaps exist and would need to be closed for a successful implementation, a view of what the appropriate governance models and service level agreements ought to look like, as well as tactical impacts such as optimized station locations, apparatus, and fleet. We considered what it means for your organization, including a new org structure, what resourcing looks like for both career and volunteer firefighters, and what the implications might be on collective agreements. And finally, we ensured a means to remain compliant with provincial legislation and any other fire service related regulatory guidelines. Next slide, please. Our approach to these types of engagements is to bring a comprehensive and robust methodology that allows organizations to appropriately assess opportunities that are strategic and bring value to your citizens through evidence and independent analysis. And our approach on this study is no different. We started with a detailed review of documents, including both your respective fire master plans, service levels and collective agreements to get a clear picture of the current state of the respective services. We had interviews with members of council, key personnel from fire services of both towns, including unions, and fire chiefs of neighboring municipalities. We conducted an assessment of five-year response time data of both towns to identify trend patterns and analytics. We evaluated future state options based on qualitative and quantitative parameters. And finally, we completed an assessment and prioritization of future state options based on those qualitative and quantitative parameters and to make a decision. Next slide, please. Our objective today is to socialize some of the key findings of our work with you. Our presentation today is divided into five focus areas. First is what we found, which will be a summary of the challenges and pain points that, we ident that were identified through stakeholder consultations and data analysis. This relates to our consultations with stakeholders in our review of the current fire master plans. What needs to change? an overview of service level improvements required in both towns to address the challenges identified above, how it needs to change, an overview of future state operating model options to pursue the proposed service level improvements, in particular through fire consolidation. We talk about how much it will cost, which is an assessment of the financial impact of each future state model option in the indicative funding model. And finally, what lies ahead, and here we'll discuss what some of the goals should be for a consolidated fire service and what an illustrative implementation plan might look like. With that, I'll ask my colleague Navneet to properly introduce himself and begin going through what we found. 
Thanks, Mohammed. Um, good evening, Chair and Councillors. My name is Navneet Walat. I'm a manager with EY's Government Public Sector Practice. So uh, continuing to the rest of the presentation, um, as we see over here, our primary objective was to identify the current state challenges in service delivery in both towns. Those challenges are listed here. We won't go into detail into each one of them. However, we did identify gaps in the current level of service delivered by both fire departments when compared to standards that are laid down by NFPA with regard to response times, proactive inspections, and uniform standards of testing. The impact of these gaps may increase in severity as both towns in Isfil and Bradford Willembury are among the fastest growing communities in Ontario. Hence, if left unaddressed, they may have an adverse effect on the safety and well-being of the residents of the community and also on the health and safety of the firefighters involved. Next slide, please. So uh, in order to best illustrate the gap between existing and desired service levels, uh, we conducted a comparison of the completion status of the master fi fire master plan recommendations that were laid down in 2013. And we found that over 60% of the recommendations from 2013 are yet to be completed in both municipalities. So we, re we recognize that completing the objectives of the master plan has been challenging because of the unprecedented growth in both communities which have also had to deal with changing legislative requirements and staffing turnover. However, it is precisely because of this unprecedented growth that both towns may need to accelerate completion of these recommendations in order to bridge the gap between existing and desired service levels. Next slide, please. So uh, while in the previous slides, we have gone through the challenges that we have found, uh, we will now discuss the changes that are recommended in both municipalities to address these challenges. So these changes have been grouped into four focus areas, which are fire suppression, training, prevention, and administration. For fire suppression, the town of Bradford, West Willembury may consider adding one additional fire, one additional, additional full-time crew, and also increase the volunteer complement at the central station to 40 volunteer firefighters. However, if the town continues to face challenges in retaining volunteers or in ensuring a timely and consistent response from volunteer units, the town may consider adding a third full-time crew and maintain a reduced complement of volunteers. For training, the town may consider recruiting one additional training officer this is to manage the training needs of an increased staffing complement for both full-time and volunteer firefighters that are required to manage growth. In fire prevention, staffing levels are recommended to be increased for two reasons. Next slide, please. So the two reasons for increasing staffing levels in fire prevention is firstly, so that the town has capacity to conduct proactive inspections and community outreach programs for a growing population. And secondly, so that there is adequate capacity to manage plans inspections, which is a work stream that is bound to see large demand as a, as a result of growing development in the community. And finally, for support staff or administration staff, we recommend the increase of staffing level to two or three administ uh, administrative personnel, particularly the creation of a business manager position, which will be responsible for tracking and monitoring KPIs and overseeing any kind of continuous improvement programs within the fire department. Next slide. So while in the previous slides, we have covered information on what the proposed changes are in both towns in order to meet these growth related service needs. Here we'll talk about how those changes can happen. So four future state operating model options exist for both towns to pursue the service level improvements that were discussed earlier. These options are illustrated below, indicating where they stand in a continuum of decentralized or independent fire services to completely centralized or consolidated fire services. So the four options are a separate fire department, a separate department with a joint chief, a consolidated fire department where one town operates as a primary employer, and a consolidated fire department which operates under an independent board. It is to be noted that the joint chief model, which is the second option here, which is also the present interim model, uh, which is being pursued by both towns, 
has a number of challenges related to processes, policies, and administration. And we also understand that the independent board model, which is a fourth option, would also require extensive legislative changes before it can be implemented in both municipalities. Next slide. So once we identified the four future state options, we began to conduct the financial impact analysis of each option. This was done by first developing a baseline forecast for the growth in the current net cost of service. Net cost of service here refers to the total operating expenditures for fire services, less the total operating revenues. So the baseline forecast assumes that none of the service level improvements that were discussed earlier would be pursued and costs would rise only at the rate of inflation. To this baseline forecast, we then add the incremental changes in the net cost of service in order to pursue the service level improvements that were required to cater to growth in both towns. All analysis has been done through using uh, nominal dollars and the financial impact analysis of each of the future state options was evaluated over a 10 year period. Next slide. So uh, using the approach that we discussed earlier, we have prepared the estimates for the net cost of service for each of the future state options. Please note here that the consolidated fire services under a town and an independent body have been evaluated here as one single option. And the results are presented here for both municipalities. So as you can see from the, the graphs in front of you, a consolidated fire service has lower costs for both Innisfil and Bradford West Quillenbury over a 10 year period. For, Brad, for Bradford West Willembury especially, the net cost of service for the consolidated fire department is 4.2% and 3.1% less expensive when compared to an independent fire service model or a joint, chief fire, joint fire chief model respectively over a span of 10 years. Next slide, please. It is to be noted that in the event of consolidation, the towns would require a funding model to determine the proportion of costs that are to be recovered from each municipality in order to operate the fire department. An indicator funding model is prepared by us here, which is based on three equally weighted parameters that generally drive costs for fire services. These three parameters are population, property assessment, and call volumes. So based on the values of these three parameters, we have arrived at a 54 to 46 split between Innisfil and Bradford West Willembury for fire service costs. We also like to flag that the above funding model would apply to all operating costs incurred by the consolidated fire department post consolidation. And this funding model would also need to be re-evaluated on an annual basis so that any kind of changes to population or property assessment or call volumes can be incorporated, and this would depend on the nature and speed of growth in both municipalities. Next slide. We've also developed four key considerations while assessing the consolidation of fire services so that the financial impact analysis that was discussed earlier could be done as accurately as possible. And these considerations were also built from observations from other fire service consolidations across Ontario. Firstly, there would be a phased implementation over a two year period, which starts off with all entities excluding fire suppression, followed by full consolidation, which includes fire suppression. In order to ensure that consolidation happens between two equally staffed entities, we have assumed that Bradford West Quillenbury would hire one additional full-time crew prior to consolidation. All capital costs for the new Bradford West Quillenbury station would be borne by BWG, which would also own the title deed for the new fire station. However, operating costs for the new fire station, similar to all operating costs, would be shared between the two municipalities after completion of the pilot phase. And wage harmonization has also been done for all new positions. However, we'd like to point out that the impact of wage harmonization is relatively low because of the similarities between the collective bargaining agreements of both municipalities. Next slide, please. Now, aside from all the quantitative benefits of consolidation that were discussed earlier, there are a number of qualitative benefits through improvements in service delivery. 
And some of, these, some of these benefits will be discussed in these upcoming slides. The first expected benefit is an improvement in response times. So NFPA standards require a response time of six minutes and 24 seconds, 90% of the time. Bradford West Gwilmbury's median, median response times are illustrated in the diagrams on the right hand side, which represent the median response times across various areas over the town across a five year time period. Hence, staffing level improvements and access to a larger pool of firefighters will enable the town to bridge the gap between the current performance standard and the desired NFPA performance standard. Next slide, please. Another indicator of uh, service efficiency is the turnout time, which is the time between alarm activation and the first truck leaving the station. Improvements in staffing levels may enable Bradford West Gwilimbury to close the gap between current performance, which is 101 seconds, and improving it by over 26% to meet the NFPA standards of 80 seconds. Next slide, please. Improvements in staffing levels can also help reduce the amount of alone time, which is the time which is spent by the first arriving truck alone at an emergency that requires multiple units to respond to it. Alone time analysis for both municipalities is illustrated below. It's to be noted that uh, high levels of alone time, especially in the event of a fire, are detrimental for the safety of residents and also places firefighters at a high risk if they attempt to conduct a rescue without adequate backup or support. It can also help reduce uh, reliance on mutual or automatic aid from other municipalities, which at times may be time consuming. Next slide. And finally, consolidation may help in joint decision-making regarding locations of stations so that they are mutually beneficial to both communities to the extent possible. Uh, in order to illustrate this, we conducted an, an analysis of the six minute drive time radius of the two locations that are currently under consideration by both towns. That is highlighted in green in this map. Then we also conducted a separate analysis to identify other potential locations that are based on projected call volumes based on growth in both municipalities. We identified that a, look at a, that a location at point C shown in blue would have a higher coverage area of projected incidents in both municipalities. So this points to the benefits of partnerships where both municipalities can have access to a larger pool of resources without the need of duplicative investments from both sides. Next slide. And I will hand it over to Mohammed to take us through. Thanks, Navneet. There are a few other key takeaways of the consolidation analysis that must be acknowledged. There are significant qualitative impacts of consolidation that will benefit both municipalities. It may provide benefits such as access to a wider pool of resources in the event of an emergency, or the ability to collaborate on initiatives such as development of a fi master fire plan. Consolidation may also lead to improved standardization of training, public education and prevention programs, and facilitate sharing of leading practice between departments to improve outcomes to the community. There will continue to be a potential for future efficiencies in addition to the ones already quantified. Exploring efficiencies in fire suppression, such as sharing a fleet or spare apparatus, may also lead to additional cost savings for both municipalities. It may also enable the municipalities to avoid duplication of future service improvements for both external services, such as purchasing of new fire apparatus, and internal services, such as the modernization of financial budgeting or reporting tools. And finally, other benefits will also prevail, such as economies of scale during activities like procurement or recruitment, which have not been evaluated in the financial impact analysis as these cannot be estimated accurately at this point. So while our analysis indicates that fire consolidation may lead to reduced cost of service for, B for BWG and marginally higher costs for Innisfil, that cost may be outweighed by service level and operational improvements that would not be available in an independent fire department. Next slide, please. Through our work, we've identified a series of goals meant to address any challenges or pain points that might arise through consolidation, but also to leverage opportunity in a more efficient and optimized fire service. The Consolidated Fire Department would need to develop a joint fire master plan to assist the governance committee and the councils of both towns with determining the strategic goals, objectives, and service levels of the fire department. 
It would include an updated community risk assessment and standards of cover, and must take into consideration the impact of growth in both municipalities. It must consider the individual and collective needs and circumstances of each town, including but not limited to ge geographic area, urban versus rural areas, and critical infrastructure, among others. The updated master plan and risk assessment could then better inform development of a 10-year capital and operating forecast and asset management plan. The Consolidated Fire Department must improve the effectiveness of prevention, prevention and education in the community. That means developing a public education policy, a fire inspection policy, vulnerable occupancy inspections, and drills that meet the requirements of the Fire Protection and Prevention Act. The new consolidated service can work towards ensuring consistent training standards right across the board, including all career firefighters, volunteer firefighters, fire prevention inspectors, and all personnel develop, delivering public safety education. The fire department may institute guidelines on attendance requirements and minimum training hours for volunteer firefighters to ensure that they maintain the necessary skills and capabilities to function on call when required. The consolidated department must implement standardized procedures and track and monitor KPIs to improve responsiveness of fire suppression teams. This includes common paging callback procedures for career and volunteer firefighters to improve the turnout time and a mature response matrix to formalize the nature of response required for different types of incidents. Response times, turnout times, and assembly time are among the performance measures that must be tracked, reviewed, and reported on a regular basis. Finally, the new department must implement policies and procedures for the collection and storage of key performance data through a robust records management system, which can then be used to support better management decision making related to everything from staffing levels to training programs. Next slide, please. Finally, we have created an illustrative example of what, could, what an indicative implementation plan could look like. It starts with communications with the public and the development of a consolidated service agreement following which the consolidation of the two services can take place and the governance committee can be established. Over a period of time, there is then a methodical approach to updating the policies, service levels and KPIs, further hiring as required and so on. Our final report to the steering committee provides further details. However, the timelines and subactivities are likely to be revised once a formal project team is stood up. That concludes our remarks an overview of our report. We're happy to address any questions at this time. Uh, thank you, gentlemen, for that uh, excellent report. I apologize, I didn't introduce uh, Brent Thomas, our uh, fire chief, our, our uh, joint fire chief for Innisfil and Bradford. Thank you for joining us, Brent. We have Brent here to answer any questions that we might have. I think it's a, a great report. I, uh, I'm really excited about this. I think there's some groundbreaking opportunities for us uh, in this moving this fire department uh, forward between the two communities. I think there's a great opportunity here. I, I'd like to throw a couple things out there and I, I'm gonna throw it to everybody uh, to open up for questions or whatever, but I'm, I'm gonna throw a couple things out there that I've been thinking about with this report. And number one, I'd like to look at uh, the Innisfil or, or the Bradford second hall. To me, it's nothing. It's a, it, we, we knew we were going to build a hall. We were going to build a second hall. So over the next few years, we, we figured we'd probably build a hall anyways. So I don't see that as a capital expenditure. I don't see it as anything that's going to impact us uh, moving forward with this amalgamation. I think it's something we knew we were going to do. So I, I rule that out. The 20 firefighters that we're looking to pay potentially hire over the next, uh, in 2022, I was hoping that maybe the, 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 the uh, consultant team and the, and the, and the, the, the uh, striking team or whatever uh, could look at it and say, Listen, why don't we turn around and do this and say, let's separate. We have uh, right now we have 60 firefighters, Bradford has 20, Innisville has 40. Let's give 10 to, in a sense, the cost wise, give 10 to Bradford. So we go 30, 30, because all that is, is just saying uh, the consultant team is saying, you know, let's have the same fire complement going forward so that we can amalgamate this process. So uh, I see this as something we could talk about with uh, the CAOs and the striking committee or the steering committee. If they could look at that and say, how can we do this uh, without impacting us for 20 direct firefighters in one year? Not going to change the service. We're not going to impact the service. We're just going to take pick up uh, ten firefighters to make the complement thirty thirty. So I see that as a potential um, opportunity. So it doesn't impact us that far. We could then make arrangements to hire more fire uh, service people as we move through this process, uh, the uh, pilot process, and the uh, over the next we could complement twenty more over the next uh, two to five years. So I think there's opportunities for that, and I think that needs to be discussed. 
The other one is I'd like to take the plans examiner and I'd like to move that under the, ch the, the chief building official. Uh, to me, that, uh, we don't need to keep that, that in the fire services. I think this is an opportunity for us to move that and move it into a chief building officials under the chief building officials for both communities. And we all know that that, uh, that, that area is in a, a full recovered, uh, full recovered for, uh, for funds. It's not a tax. It's not uh, an impact to the taxpayer. So I think it's an opportunity there for us to do a cost savings and uh, still get the same service. Uh, firefighters could go out and do their inspections and, and continue to uh, do the fire prevention. But I think the plans examiner being a full recovered position, if we put it under the chief building official, is something that taxpayers can uh, look forward to. So uh, I like this. I really do. I think it's an opportunity for us to really uh, push this uh, this amalgamation. And I'm going to fully support moving forward uh, with these come, come of the, uh, some of these uh, ideas that I've been talking about. I'd also uh, um, like to uh, um, see that we... We move this forward in a sense so that uh, uh, we can we can. I think there's opportunities for us to really change the system, and I I, I kind of like the board idea also option four. I kind of like that. I I've been thinking about that one, and and the the, the big thing is when you look at it, they say that it we're going to maybe duplicate HR and and uh, some of the uh, you know the treasurer's position stuff like that, but. I think as you build your fire department out, you're going to probably build your own HR like we do. I like the, I like the police service board. I like the way they run their business. And I think it's something that uh, it might be down the road we could do that. The one thing I like about it is it actually, asks, it actually makes us go in and look at the Fire Prevention Act. And we actually get to open it up to say, hey, we need to design boards for these the fire departments. And it allows us to do some discussion with the province and say, well, while we're in there, we could change a couple of things. And maybe one thing we look at is the arbitration uh, issue that uh, everybody's talking about through Ontario. So I, I not saying that we're going to go to the board, but I say it, it it's something that I'd like to see us uh, look at moving forward. I think it's an option that I want to continue to pursue and see if the province is open to actually uh, looking at boards for a fire service. Not that I support it, like not that I fully support it, but I, I do like the idea of looking at it as an option moving forward. So we have option three and option four. So I, I discussed a few things through a few things out there and I open up to everybody else if they have any questions on this uh, um, amalgamation process. Um, if not, uh, well, let me read the recommendation. I'm sorry, I didn't read the recommendation. I just got going without putting the recommendation on the floor. I probably should put that on the floor first, and then we could open up to further discussion. All right, I apologize for that. So, recommendation that the report FIR 2022-01 regarding the fire uh, consolidation assessment for Innisfil Fire and Rescue Service and Bradford's Glenbury Fire and Emergency Service dated January 18, 2022, be received, and that the town of Innisfil and the town of Bradford's Glenbury. Fire Consolidation Assessment Report dated October 29, 2021, be received, and that the Council endorse the future expiration and the cons uh, consolidation of the, of the fire services in the Town of Bradford's Glenbury and the Town of Venezuela, with a particular focus on Option 3 and Option 4, as identified in the report repair, uh, prepared by Ernest and Young, and that staff be directed to report back to Council in Q2 2022 with a recommendation on the optional approach, the optimal approach to consolidation and its implementation, taking into account considerations including operations, labor relations, governance, financial impact, and should also include a proposed timeline for any uh, further steps towards consolidation of the two fire services, and that all costs related to the further assessment be equally shared between the two municipalities and be funded from existing fire service operating budget and other sources such as reserve funds or grants that will be explored if required and that staff review the outcomes of the County of Simcoe Regional Fire Service Review and consider any relevant findings or recommendations from that report. Uh, move to a second, put that on the floor, please. Move to Councillor Danke, second to Councillor Contua. So again, any uh, comments or questions on this report? It was a lengthy one, it was a good one. I, uh, I like the process. Uh, uh, Mayor Keffer, please. Yes, thank you, Deputy Mayor. And, uh, <laughs> Yeah, the, the one big stumbling block is definitely a new contingent of firefighters uh, in the time frame that, that uh, is spelled out here. I, I, I don't think our municipality can hand budget, handle budget-wise hiring 20 more firefighters uh, in quick su succession that uh, uh, hopefully there's some innovative ways that uh, that uh, could be mitigated. Uh, I know the, the uh, County of Simcoe uh, was doing a, a study, the POMAX report, and they were looking at, uh, uh, I guess, the emergency calls uh, related to health matters. 
and they were looking at uh, having uh, two dedicated uh, fire uh, officers on a smaller vehicle dedicated to emergency response for medical issues instead of the whole uh, four firefighters going out on a large truck. And uh, would there be opportunities to look at, at uh, efficiencies as far as that is concerned that we don't need uh, 20 firefighters that all at once could we uh, uh, be able to uh, have that in, in one way or the other uh, at the deputy mayor's uh, idea uh, certainly is, is worth exploring to see whether that would be an opportunity. And I, I, I think I'm just from the perspective at, at, of all emergency services that our town funds through the budget, our police uh, uh, budget, uh, there is a report on tonight's uh, committee of the whole meeting and uh, right now fire is about 50% of what the police budget is. I looked at the city of Barrie and it's similar. The, the fire budget is about 50% of what the police budget is and that I'm just afraid that if we increase the, the fire budget as much as what this uh, report is uh, uh, suggesting that uh, uh, <laughs> will cause issues with, with our, our, our police department, uh, wondering why they can't uh, increase their budget as well. So we, we have to look at it holistically uh, as what our residents can afford, what we can uh, do as far as uh, having a, a top-notch fire service uh, that uh, meets the criteria and uh, be able to uh, find some innovative ways to be able to get the efficiencies to be able to meet the standards. So those are my comments, Deputy Mayor, that uh, hopefully that uh, we can look at this further and look at other opportunities to, to move this forward. So thank you, Deputy Mayor. Yes, thank you, Worship. And I, I see that as the same. I think there's opportunities there through the policies and procedures to actually identify areas where we can we change some of the services. And uh, you're absolutely right when we talk about the ProMax uh, consultants that came in and did the county one. Uh, they're talking about the key performance indicators, and that's tracking that and understanding, uh, are, you know, are we doing, are we delivering the best services and are we doing it at the right cost and, and how's that working? And they did talk about uh, a different size vehicle going out to some of these calls. So there's opportunities starting with a new amalgamated service that we could probably uh, look at something like that moving forward. So uh, great points and great, great opportunity. Uh, Councillor Sandu. Thank you, Chair. I would like to thank the consultants, staff of both municipalities uh, and, and uh, Chief Thomas for working hard on this report. Um, even though all of us, uh, I think all of us do want to save money for both of our municipalities, uh, and I, there is a potential, but similar to what Mayor Kaffer said, um, the more I read into this report, the more what was looking at me was this now became a hiring thing rather than saving money and consolidating two fire departments. You know, we're looking at hiring a full crew of firefighters full time. And then we know we were going to build another fire hall, but now this timeline is shrinking. We had a little bit of a longer timeline. I think this one spoke of, uh, I remember reading it somewhere in the report, two years. Um, that, that's not sitting well. I'm in still favor of pursuing this and looking at our options, but uh, I don't believe that we need to go out and hire all these people to make it work. There's municipalities around us that just strictly run on volunteer firefighters. You know, why do we need to go hire 20 new firefighters now and make this work. Um, we need to hire, report says hire a business manager to keep the stats on KPIs and, and, uh, and uh, other indicators. Uh, you know, like all these positions gonna add up and cost money down the road to both municipalities. So I, I'm in still favor of pursuing it and looking at the options, but we have to look, you know, outside the box. Hiring people and just putting them in and saying, look, let's spend money now and hope we're going to save in the next 5, 10, 15 years. Um, yeah, probably yes, but these money, these, these positions are going to cost money to our taxpayers now. 
So great points, Councilor Sandu, and I, uh, I I absolutely understand what you're saying. Where the business manager things like that, but that's what the ProMax consult. And, and if you the last comment in the recommendation is a staff review of the outcomes of the county of Simcoe's regional review. I think that's a key important thing to have in here. And I think the county is, uh, I was hoping that we, uh, I don't know if you've seen the report from ProMax, but it talks about Reclamation 9 and 10, and it talks about the county actually doing the KPIs for the municipalities throughout uh, Simcoe County. So uh, again, this this report is great. Uh, the policies and procedures are something we can decide as, a, as the steering committee moves forward on the hiring and, and things like that. But I think uh, we certainly have to look at the county report because it, it does pick up on that area, those business managers, things like that. So there's opportunities for us to actually save money and use the county at the same time to deliver on that. So Councillor Dykin and Councillor Contois. Sorry, Mark, I, I know you had your hand up before me, yeah. but um, I, I can concur, concur. You know, I see the advantages and over a 10 year and beyond uh, of cost analysis uh, by putting departments together, sharing the chief, sharing the cost of uh, buying things together, uniforms, uh, the fire department, uh, you know, provides such a uh, important service and uh, to see us maintain and better service, I can see the value. The only thing that worries me and just like um, our, mayor, our mayor mentioned is, is that 20 officers, that's the only thing that uh, shocks me i think is uh, i like to see the impact to, to a budget to see how that impacts it that's my concern um i think that um, what i don't want to see us lose is the quality of, of service when uh, i know that a lot of commercial uh, stores now uh, insurance is being very is a big uh, issue and um renewing the insurance and the runs are expert in this field but but I know that uh, fire prevention is such a place and a play is important part now and even more so in the future and I hope that that we don't lose that level of service uh, by uh, um, spreading us uh, out, uh, out with, between Innocent and Bradford I think we have to maintain we have a good uh, fire prevention team and I think we need to continue to uh, provide those services uh, uh, and don't lose uh, don't, don't lose that uh, scope of things. But at the end of the day, um, my, uh, I like option four, the having a board and having uh, uh, people from municipalities, so from, from Minnesota and Bradford um, working together. And I like the, I read today on, on, uh, on, uh, on, the, on Facebook or, or I guess on the, on the internet about this is a marriage. At the end of the day, we also have to uh, be very, uh, um, Dot all our T's and uh, and and do this uh, uh, do this right and and I know I talked to many people that went through this in in Central York and it worked out quite well and I believe this can work out as well. We just need uh, Ernst and Young to 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 look at every page and dot every I and and come back to us with future dates and and uh, we need to really study this and understand really understand this project because there's a lot of benefits service and and and, and as everything spells out everything spelled out in the report but we need to to do this right and and we're talking uh, we're talking a big project but but uh, i can see you know in this is going to grow it might even grow fast will grow faster in bradford at the end of the day they have lots of land a lot of seems like they have more subdivisions on the work than we have so so you know we have to be open-minded and nobody knows what the future Holes the next 10 years. Yeah, we never think that we go through the pandemic, but at the end of the day, who knows where, where the crystal ball is, but we have to be open-minded and uh, look at look at everything with this whole project. It's a, it is a big project at the end of the day, but uh, I'd like to see us go forward and continue to investigate. Yeah, thank you for the comments, Councilor Daggy. The, the marriage part, yeah, that's a little tough to deal with, but Everybody's talking about prenums now, so we certainly could uh, build the, the prenums into it, I guess. So, Councillor Contra and then Councillor uh, Lamb. Yeah, I think I think a lot of you have touched on various parts. Uh, there's parts of this that are good, and other parts that make no sense to me. Uh, hiring 20 firefighters in that short distance is just asinine. We can't afford that. Period. I'll never support it. So, figure out something different, in my view. Uh, the second fire hall, yes, we need that. That's going to be built in Bondhead. So we figure, let's say we start building that tomorrow. You're looking at a, a year's timeline to build it. We're looking at at least two years, three years before a fire hall is built. If, if we're going to hire more firefighters, which we need to do, there has to be some sort of savings. And I'm not seeing it. Uh, 
You talked about the uh, building uh, uh, division taking over an aspect of inspections, and I agree with that totally. That's a cost savings for the communities, period. I like the idea of, of two firefighters going to accidents or, or maybe not accidents, but uh, a, a house call that might be a distress. Uh, I, you know, do we actually, I have a group home in front of me guys, so I get to see it and I get to see fire services, police services, ambulance services sit out front of the building for hours and that shouldn't happen. If, if they're no longer required, they should be back to the station doing exactly what they need to do, which is fight fires and, and ready for the next response. Uh, so I like to see improvements in those types of things. Uh, uh, and the duplication is one of them. And, and like you said, the building division is, as far as I'm concerned, the duplication. We're already in there inspecting buildings. And there's no reason why if a special course needs to be given to these uh, folks, then we give them a course and, and we cover it through taxation. Those are the types of things I want to see, and I'm not seeing it so far. So if we're going to go ahead and, and hire firefighters, which I know we need to do, then maybe we should be hiring four of them in this fourth quarter and, and hire four of them so it relieves some of the pain in the future because 20 firefighters is just way too expensive. Yeah, so that's the overarching theme is the 25 hours. And I, like I said, I think there's a way that we can work around that without impacting the service. And, and what I like about it is you get to start fresh. You get to start right from the right from the bottom, work your way up, recreate the policies, recreate procedures, recreate how we deliver our, our emergency services throughout our communities. And I think that's a wonderful opportunity for us to really structure that. Uh, any, uh, you know what, Brent, I haven't asked you any comments, Brent, from you, right? I'm sorry, I'll get Councillor Lamb first, then I'll go to uh, Brent, if you don't mind, for some comments. Yeah, I, I'm not going to repeat what everybody said, but I'm going to suggest that uh, there's more than two players in this game. And if we build a, a fire station at, uh, you know, Fifth Side Road and an uh, and 88 or even in Bond Head, we still have to deal with uh, King Township, which uh, deals in the far west corner of the municipality. Um, uh, Beaton is closer to uh, stuff on 27 than what we currently have. So new tech has maybe a role to play. And also the uh, town, town, township of Vesa uh, has a bit of a role to play in Innisfil on the west side, of course, because I'm not certain how far the uh, Cookstown Fire Department can, can cover. Does it go to Thornton or, or wherever? So this is almost like a South Simcoe, uh, a Southeastern South Simcoe study because we can do our own game here, but we still have the fringes uh, because we can't be all things to all people, no matter whether we have a 5, 10, or 20, and buy all new rolling stock, we still can't cover all the corners without help from others. So I, and I, I think I suggested this before, is that we need to look at what is the role of, uh, of Schaumburg, for instance, in the Southwest Quadrant, or what is the role of, uh, I'm saying of, of King, and what is the role down uh, you know, uh, south uh, on uh, on Young Street and such like that. So where do we cover to, and and uh, where does uh, Hall Landing go to, and then the Central uh, York Fire Department. So I'm saying it's bigger than us too, uh, but it may be doable. But like I I have the same concerns as, as everybody else. Uh, we don't have a great deal of fires, but we have a great deal of work. Uh, and we also have to ensure that uh, that we're there in a timely manner when somebody needs somebody. When somebody needs an emergency service, they don't care about what uh, what the political ramifications are. They just want them there. So that's what I got to say. Thank you. Yeah, so great points, Councilor Lambert. We do have uh, joint services uh, agreements with other uh, with King and all those. So, uh, but I'll ask uh, Brent Thomas to comment on the uh, on the consultant's report and give his. Uh, point of views on, on things. So Brent, would you like to comment? Sure, thanks uh, Deputy Mayor. I've, uh, I probably have several comments here. I wrote a lot of notes down. I don't know if I'm gonna cover them all, um, but I will I'll cover a few things off. Um, um, I think I hear the overarching uh, concern is with hiring 20 people. And what, uh, what I wanna make sure that I, I highlight with uh, our council here, uh, because it's covered off uh, 
uh, in many areas of the Ernst & Young report is the level of service. So we go with our uh, enabling bylaw, uh, regulating enabling bylaw for the fire department and what we're asked to do. And so then what we're asked to do based on the mandate that we have from council, uh, we have to follow standards. And right now uh, we're at a higher risk in, in EWG with uh, just having one full-time crew based on our, our hazard analysis, our risk profile of our community, uh, the amount of travel time that we have. Um, we are doing a good job and we have a, a great volunteer force that also serve us well. Uh, but in order, able to recruit and retain volunteers and new volunteers, uh, it, it becomes problematic in, in, in uh, recruiting them and then being able to retain them. Uh, you'll have about half of your volunteer force that are, are, are just wanting to serve the community. You'll have another a good number of your volunteer force who are, are doing this, gaining experience and are looking for full-time employment. And if we don't have that here, obviously they're going to go to other places. And so that affects our ability to retain. However, we can realize the benefit of, of using them while we have them. Uh, the concern we have, and it's, and it's mentioned in the report, I'm sorry, I don't have the page number in front of me, but quite obviously if from what I'm hearing, you're gonna ask for uh, us to go back and consider um, you know, option three and, and give you an answer on option four so we can do a little bit of a deeper dive on that. But looking at um, the, the amount of people that we have on scenes that are alone, that alone time slide uh, is very telling. And so the, the graph changed, it, it was over three years, uh, the way it was presented uh, by Ernst & Young tonight. But the far right of that is the amount of time that crews are on scene by themselves. And there is a standard and there is a safety issue if a crew is on scene by themselves, especially in a fully involved or a high risk call being uh, most often a house fire or a complicated rescue event. And so uh, we do require that they have teams that are able to save them and, and bail them out, rescue teams, RIT teams, we call them. Um, and uh, so currently we're waiting for that from either uh, our volunteers assembling and responding or from our, uh, our mutual aid or our auto aid agreements. And I'll speak to that again in a, in a moment. Uh, so remind me if I forget to. Uh, the, the concern I have is the, is the high number of uh, growth that we're having in our community as outlined in the report. And it's still at Bradford are among the uh, fastest growing communities in, in Ontario. And so uh, it's incumbent on us to be able to maintain safety of, first of all, uh, I look at our fire personnel and I also look equally at our community and how are we serving them and are, are we able to serve them safely uh, with the numbers that we have. And we're not meeting the standard currently. Uh, and we, there, it's quite frankly been a couple years since we've been able to meet that standard, although we're doing a good job with what we have. Uh, it does place us in a, in a higher risk category. And so uh, that's the, rec the reason for the recommendation. Uh, for the hiring of a second crew. A second crew is 20 people. And yes, that comes with a big uh, price tag. And I completely understand that. I'm, I'm completely understanding that we have to be good stewards of the budget dollars and the finances that we're entrusted to by our community. But at the same time, uh, when we're asked to provide that level of service and then follow that standard, it does come with that price tag of being able to staff. I fully support the fact that we'll look at options and ways that we can uh, lessen the impact of hiring staff or the potential to hire more volunteers and getting them up to speed. It, uh, I like to think and, I, and that we do our best to make sure that our volunteers and career firefighters are trained to the same level. But until that time, we also ensure that our volunteers are not placed in a position where they're not trained for. So we have to alter our response patterns and, and what we ask them to do at a scene until we can get that training done. So I understand the cost and we can come up with some recommendations, but we also uh, are following and uh, responding to and, and, and trying to meet the standards that we're required to based on uh, what calls that we respond to. Um, plans examiner, certainly we can look at that. There, there is some increase if we were to take the fire side of it and include the fire code on top of the building code. I mean, we're talking about one position. If we, if we go with option three and we blend uh, the departments that would be one position, one position amongst both towns. So I, I, I mean that's a, that's a relatively small impact, but that's something that we can absolutely look at, understanding that that will increase the amount of time that inspection is done by a building department person. But we can we can overcome that and we can look at that. Uh, if I could speak just very quickly to option four, 
um, and the governance board or a, a, call it a fire services board complete, compared to a police services board, um, we will achieve uh, just very quickly, uh, similar to that with uh, implementation of option three, where our governance board will be the two CAOs. It will be myself and then two or three members of council. So we have representation and say from both, uh, both towns, uh, and then we can carry any of those initiatives forward. If you, uh, I think you mentioned uh, Deputy Mayor, uh, if there was a, you know, a, a fire prevention uh, issue that needed to be adjusted in the province, we have the capability, we have the platform to do that. And we can do that through our governance board in an option three model. Option four will be uh, uh, time consuming. Uh, um, I've consulted and spoken with several people at the provincial level. Obviously not a legal opinion because they all want to be paid for that legal opinion, uh, but that will have to be done at some point. But uh, I do trust the people in, in the provincial um, agencies that I've spoken to and in, and in the legislature, they all have a similar opinion. The Fire uh, Protection and Prevention Act and the Municipal Act do not preclude a fire services board, but both of those acts also do not allow it. So everyone is of the same opinion that it would have to change both acts in the legislature, uh, and this being an election year, will draw that process out. Uh, and if we now, now obviously we can we can come up with our own thing, but uh, if we were going to mirror a police services board, uh, then there are those issues that HR, finance, etc., uh, is a service that will need to be hired out as opposed to it being uh, one town assuming responsibility and the other town uh, paying their portion on whatever is agreed. So um, that's, uh, that's uh, what I wanted to say on option four. Um, sorry, if I could just look at my notes for a second, Deputy Mayor, I, I, I wanna make sure I'm, I'm talking to some of your points, but I don't, I don't, wanna, I don't wanna miss them. Um, You've done a great job. If you wanna just grab, <laughs> grab your thoughts and uh, I know Councillor Sandu has a question. Uh, Brent, I really like the explanation on option four and I, uh, I, I like that fact that you've brought that forward. So I, uh, I, I, I like that. Uh, you, you do make great points on uh, on looking at option three as the strong. Uh, we still get the same governance out of option three. So, Councillor Sandu, I'll get Chief, back to you Brent, right after. Thank, thank you, Deputy Mayor Chief. Thanks, thanks for your points and, and the explanation. I really appreciate all the hard work your team and you do. Um, and I also understand that um, having volunteer firefighters, uh, when the opportunity comes, they go for a full time job. Um, you know, rightfully, if, if they're looking for a full-time career and they see that our municipality is not going to hire anytime soon, and you can't blame them for going where their uh, livelihood is. I, I was quickly looking uh, on Google right now, and 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 I searched for King. King came up as a as a all volunteer department with 105 staff members. I don't know if that's current or accurate, but I'm just reading offline. How do they get away with just having a volunteer? firefighter of 105 staff members and not have to worry about all these um, guidelines or, or expectations of having a full-time crew go out and, and all that stuff. Uh, where's the disconnect or are they not following the, the guidelines? So we'll give that to know. Chief. Yeah, I don't know if uh, Navneet or, or Mohammed has uh, want to answer to that. There, uh, I didn't do the review um, on on the fire services. Uh, Ernst and Young did, um, but it will. You, you, there are several considerations, and and uh, Councillor Sandu, I'm, I I I don't know what they are uh, or were for um, for for King. Uh, it, it would be based on their uh, risk profile, what their community growth is. They'll look at things like. Um, what uh, level of service they provide through their uh, enabling bylaw, and, uh, and and so they will they will decide what type of fire department they provide and fire service they provide based on that. I, I don't have that information in front of me. I see Navneed has uh, unmuted his mic. Maybe I'll turn it over to him if he's got some more information for you, Councillor Sandy. Yeah, through the chair to the councillor, um, it's. Uh, we're actually building on the response of uh, Chief Thomas that there are multiple um, factors to be considered. Yeah, the first one is the community risk assessment um, of, of both municipalities and how uh, the, the, the scenario at King with respect to the densification of growth, uh, the, the 
rural and urban mix of population, the growth plans of both municipalities, the, the composition of residential versus non-residential growth, all of that would factor into um, the, the community risk assessment. The second one is the growth, uh, is, is the service standards that are laid down by uh, each municipality. And our understanding is that uh, the service standards laid down by King is different from the service standards that are laid down by Bradford, West, Gurumbury. Uh, it's also important to note that um, our recommendations based on um, the, uh, based on the consideration for the need of a full-time crew is based on the assessment of the current uh, response time by volunteer firefighters at both municipalities. And as, as was covered in the presentation earlier, the response time, the median response time for volunteer firefighters is 12.5 minutes, which means that 50% of uh, responses happen at a time which is greater than 12.5 minutes. And if you consider it um, to be in the event of uh, an actual fire, as was the case in, in Bradford in 2021, uh, that is a lot of time uh, which, which could create risk for the community. So it was taking into consideration all of these factors, including the current response times by volunteer crews. And as, as uh, Chief Thomas alluded to, the difficulties that municipalities are having in hiring and retaining and training volunteers that's what led to our recommendation of the need to consider a full-time crew. Thank you, Navdi. Uh, Deputy Mayor, if I can have a follow-up. But just, so was King part of the consideration when, when uh, or the assessment when you did the report or, or they weren't included uh, as part of the assessment? So to yeah. clarify, um, all of the municipalities that are surrounding uh, the uh, Innisfil and Bradford West Gwilimbury were, were part of our jurisdiction analysis just to understand how they interact with uh, both municipalities, Innisfil and Bradford West Gwilimbury. We did not do a detailed service review of how those fire services are delivered in, 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 in their respective jurisdictions. We just wanted to understand from the perspective of how they interact with uh, both municipalities through automatic and mutual aid agreements and how any kind of conversations around consolidation would impact these jurisdictions. And if there is a, if there is a possibility to expand that conversation of consolidation to other municipalities, which was also the theme of the review that was conducted by Simcoe County. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Councillor Sandhu. Uh, Councillor Scott. Thank you, and I'd like to thank as well the uh, the team from ENY and the chief. Uh, the chief actually answered a few of my questions, and I, I think I'm I'm glad to hear that option three could accommodate some sort of a joint municipal board. That that almost completely, I think, takes away, in my mind, the need to look at option four if we get a lot of the benefits anyway in option three. Um, I understand the need to have uniform service levels, and, and that's where the idea of hiring a new crew for Bradford comes from. But what I don't understand is why that would be happening in the way it's laid out. I, I, to me, that seems like what the consolidation should do as part of its process. We're not merging, uh, but only after we hire up in order to meet some level. I think we need to look at this more holistically as part of a merger agreement and not have the existing fire hall seen as silos that just stay status quo. I think we need to look globally across the two municipalities and where resources are allocated in terms of employees and then see what the needs are if there could be that spreading out. So I, I, I think if we're able to look at this as a merger with an implementation plan and maybe knowing that we have to get up to some staff level as opposed to starting from uh, the marriage metaphor makes me feel like we're having to fork over a pretty large dowry before we can even enter negotiations when I think I'd rather see the the question of the staff complement to be more about how we negotiate and, and have a timeline to get there, but what there is when we're actually a merged uh, force across two municipalities, I'm wondering if there's any wiggle room there. So um, I'm really excited to see the process roll forward, but I'm just hoping that we can uh, take these questions about service levels uh, into what it would look like as two forces rather than sort of still looking at it as if we're two separate forces. Yes, great comments, Councillor Scott, and I uh, appreciate that. And that's, I think, where I was trying to go with that uh, compliment of, of, of picking up 10 uh, of the firefighters that so were equal to out the balance. And we, we start that merger from there, uh, the impact is a little bit less to, 
to everybody. It saves Innisfil money and it, it actually saves us money. So that to me is a merger of uh, a mutual understanding and we work towards uh, increasing our service levels as we go through that process. So that's where I would really like to get to. I, we all understand Bradford needs to increase their service levels. Uh, moving forward, we have the second firewall coming that we're going to uh, potentially build in the Bondhead area and where it uh, from the report, the location, you know, there's a there's a location that suits uh, both the municipalities better than uh, by putting it somewhere. So I uh, look forward to that. Look forward to seeing us uh, move forward. Look forward to seeing uh, us uh, venture down this uh, road to amalgamation. I think it's a, I think it's a wonderful opportunity for both municipalities to uh, create a service that is a, a second to none, and we can create a new model for fire service, emergency services uh, moving forward throughout Ontario. So, look forward to that. So, any further comments or questions, Councillor uh, Councillor Contwa, sorry. Thank you, Deputy Mayor Leduc. Um, yeah. Well, a great conversation, guys. Um, I, I I just I picked up on something, and I maybe I'm misunderstood, but you said the king had a different service level than our service level. Uh, how does that work? Um, and that's one of the portions uh, of the question I'm going to ask. But uh, you know, and, and guys, I think this is fantastic. I, it's something we need to look at. Uh, so don't get me wrong when I said I'm not going to support this the way it stands. I, I do support a lot of the ideas in here. I just don't support 20 firefighters all at the same time. Um, so at the end of the day, I, I want to talk about the service levels first. Uh, that caught my curiosity. Am I missing something or I'd like to uh, uh, comment on that, I guess. Yes, through the chair to the councillor. Um, to just to clarify the comment, uh, what we meant was that the, the the service levels that are that are um, you know put forward by both councils are is different in both municipalities. So every council, as per like the master fire plan, would 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 mandate like what the respond minimum response times are, what the service standards are in terms of the uh, of, of of turnout time, uh, response time for incidents, etc. Those service standards are different in both municipalities compared to what uh, is, is mandated at Bradford, West Quillenbury and, uh, and King. Um, and as, as mentioned earlier, we have not done a detailed service review on um, the, the service provided at King. So we cannot comment on whether uh, their current staffing complement accurately matches their service level. We will, uh, matches, match, matches their service level. We can only um, you know, provide a comment on whether or not um, Bradford's current uh, staffing complement, the way it's currently set up, does it meet the needs of Bradford? Uh, Bradford from from two perspectives, uh, in, in in terms of growth, in terms of current response time, and in terms of the future of the volunteer staffing model. Thank you for that. And just to follow up, you talked about Bradford having, uh, I think it was 101 seconds uh, to leave their station uh, for for uh, response time. And you wanted to get that to 80 seconds. So we already have a full complement, and, and they're getting out of the door at 101 seconds. Uh, how do you plan on improving that? And I, I just, I'm just curious. So maybe I could speak to that, uh, Deputy Mayor LeDuc. Uh, obviously, you, we've, looked, we've got to look at our KPIs and how our staff are performing. We also have to look at how our staff are being dispatched and uh, evaluate uh, evaluate those processes. I've uh, I, I've obviously you you gentlemen have hired me, uh, and uh, since I've been here, I've I've already made a little bit of progress, and I've I've noticed some things in my own evaluation of of where we are and where we need to be. Uh, in addition to and and comparatively with uh, the E and Y report, knowing uh, what's been in it and and being proposed with working with the team for a while. So uh, I would suggest to you that the 2020 number that we can see some improvements on for sure. Um, uh, but it's uh, part of that is keeping on top of, uh, you know, our, our KPIs and how are we performing compared to the standard and what we do we need to do to adjust. So that those are starting points, uh, Councillor Contois, on how we would, we would achieve those um, and, uh, and then make improvements and suggestions for, for efficiencies or, or whatever mechanical physical things that we need to do to make the response response times better. That's that's on us to, to evaluate those. Excellent, thank you. Uh, and Brent, uh, Chief Thomas, you have any uh, further comments you want? I know I, I 
kind of give you a, t a chance to rec recruit, uh, but any further comments before we, we close this one out? Sure, I, uh, I'll make a couple of thanks, uh, Deputy Mayor. Uh, if I can just speak to medical calls. Um, so um, for those of you that have read the county report and been involved in the, in the meetings uh, on the county side, um, data was a key driver on, on uh, their report and, and, and basically, uh, and I agree with, um, tended to um, point out that there's no common data sets that need to be uh, evaluated or, or, or reported on. Uh, and so I'm, I'm in favor of some standardization. I've got a capital budget uh, for this year for uh, a changes to our fire reporting software, which is driven by our, our, our fire dispatch done by Barry Fire. I also have a budget amount set aside in Innisfil. So we're just waiting for them to tell us who the new vendor is so that we can make improvements there. So we're already doing some of these things, but in that data um, uh, and in the data that was evaluated by the county, they had some other uh, performance indicators they, they were going to report on and could not. Um, and I made this point uh, at county council and in uh, the steering group, which uh, uh, CAO McKnight and I were both a part of that, uh, they made some suppositions, and some of their suppositions, unfortunately, uh, are based on data that's not avail available and doesn't represent what does happen and how we respond in Simcoe County. So uh, the point of, uh, of two people in a, in a vehicle to a medical call, sure, we can look at that, but you'll see that type of thing from a, a large uh, uh, urban center compared to our response protocols and, and how we respond. So for me, splitting up a crew, and then uh, I, I don't have a statistic for you, but uh, we'll certainly include that when we come back in Q2 with, with our report to you is the number of times that we have multiple calls happening at the same time. Um, if I've got crews split up and then a, a, a fire call comes in, now I'm waiting even longer at a scene to assemble a fire crew to, to then uh, to, to, to handle that call. So that's part of the consideration we have to look into. Uh, I wanted to uh, specifically talk to Councillor Contois point about uh, uh, medical people in a fire vehicle sitting on scene for uh, a long period of time. Well, um, uh, at, at some point, we have to consider the customer service and the, and the care being delivered to the patient. When an EMS arri a unit arrives on scene, they are ultimately responsible for the patient. I will have my, my full-time crew stay there and assist them, especially if we're able to assist them with some life-saving measures and someone who needs it. Um, but that also means that if a, another call comes in, that crew can leave immediately. So whether they leave from the scene, they're already mobile or leave from the station, uh, to me, if we can provide that customer service, that's, that's value added to our taxpayers. Uh, the other comment, uh, and I'm, I apologize, I can't remember who made it. I think there were a couple around uh, who responds to what in, in uh, uh, I think the example is Schaumburg and King. We do have certain areas and, and some of the things that are in the county report even and, and are in the Ernst & Young report is um, getting away from, you know, your fire service responding to every call within your urban boundary. And we've done that and we've realized some efficiencies. So we have uh, paid agreements with King uh, and, uh, and with uh, uh, um, New Tech and, uh, and um, East Willenberry so that, uh, you know, along the, the canal, uh, if it's going to take us longer to drive around the way the streets are to get to a scene, um, that's, that, that increases our response time. So in those areas, we, we uh, actually pay an agreement to have them respond there, and then they pay us to respond to their areas that we can get there quicker. So that's part of us being efficient. And so um, we, we've looked at that. We've made adjustments there so that the closest units respond so that we're providing the best service possible. The last comment I'd like to make uh, to you all is, is around level of service, uh, because I've heard this uh, quite a bit. Uh, when we looked at the uh, consolidation, we asked Ernst & Young to do the report and to, to honestly look at uh, some form of blend or consolidation, uh, the, the determining factor has been um, very strong. The direction given to the development team and to the fire service uh, to us is that we need to have like services. So uh, the evaluation of how Innisfil responds with two crews uh, is is different than how Bradford responds with one crew. So uh, Bradford uh, has chosen that level of service and our staffing pattern 
Innisfil has has chosen that one. So uh, to to start to ask um, Innisfil to um, you know have some of their firefighters move over into Bradford is now at that point diminishing the the level of service that has been um, realized and is happening in Innisfil uh, to now uh, assist Bradford out. So. Uh, I will caution you around there that, that you will hear back when we come back with the, with the uh, uh, report for you to consider in the second quarter. Uh, some of those issues will will uh, extrapolate them out and and uh, and define them uh, uh, in greater detail for you to to help understand. And I'm, I'm always happy to answer questions. Uh, if if any of you have questions or things I've heard a few of you say you didn't understand something, I'm I pick up the phone. I'm happy to to try and walk you through it and help you understand. Thank you, Deputy Mayor. Yes, thank you, Chief. I appreciate your comments and questions. Uh, definitely, uh, if anybody has any comments or questions uh, that we want to talk to Chief, please uh, reach out to him. Um, I look forward to seeing this uh, move forward, and I think there's an opportunity for us to uh, look at this from all sorts of levels. And I, I appreciate everybody's comments. I think uh, they were well, uh, well dictated uh, the comments, and I uh, I hope that the team hears it, and we'll we'll certainly uh, try and find the right balance to see if this amalgamation can uh, move forward. So we'll look forward to that. Uh, like uh, like I think uh, I think the chief made it very clear to us. Uh, I know myself now. I had some questions about option four, but I'm I'm actually. Uh, um, I don't. I think we don't need to spend too much time on option four, from my point of view. I, I don't know what yours, but it seems like the option three could deliver the same uh, same governance structure as, say, option four, and we can move that forward uh, a lot uh, less expensive. So, okay. So, any uh, no further comments or questions? Do I need to reread the recommendation? We're good with the way it, I read it the first time. You can not because I'm I'm ready to move on. <laughs> it's another long one. All right, I had a mover and a seconder. Did I not, Rebecca? Yes, thank you. Okay, so all in favor of the, uh, the recommendation as read. Thank you. Passed. Thank you, everyone. Appreciate that for a, a great, uh, great presentation. Thank you, Nevit. And uh, and where is uh, where I'm missing somebody? Oh, Mohammed, there you are. <laughs> You're on the screen in the corner. Thank you very much, gentlemen. Thank you, Chief. See you later. All right, moving on to four point two: Report of Development Engineering Services Requ uh, Request for Assumption. Uh, recommendation that report DES 2022-01 entitled Request for Assumption Solmar Homes Inc. Phase 1 be received and that the recommendation for final assumption of the works within the plan be approved and that the necessary bylaw be prepared and presented to council at the earliest opportunity and that upon written confirmation from the manager of development engineering uh, that the treasurer reduce the required securities. A mover and a second to put this on the floor, please. By Councillor Sandu, second by Councillor Perugini. Questions or concerns with this one? It's an assumption of a, a built out area. All right, seeing none, all in favor? Carried, thank you. Uh, 4.3 Report of Development Engineering, uh, request for assumption from FNB Development. So, recommendation of the report DS 2022 02, entitled Request for Assumption, FNB Developments Inc. Phase 2, Lots 4 and 5, Plan uh, 51M 979 be received and that the necessary bylaw be prepared and presented to council at the earliest opportunity and that upon written confirmation from the manager of development and engineering the treasurer reduce the required securities so this is another assumption for two um, lots i think they're model homes for fnb so question concerns with this one again seeing none all in favor carried thank you Moving on to 4.4 report. Deputy Mayor, you need a you need a move there and a seconder. Sorry. Oh, oh sorry. I <laughs> sorry. <laughs> okay, move to seconder, please. <laughs> move by Councillor Scott. Second by Councillor Contois. Sorry again. So can we uh we'll revote it. All in favor? Thank you. Sorry about that. Going too fast. I'll slow it down, gentlemen. Uh, 4.4 report of development engineering services uh, re recommendation report for proposed telecommunications tower. So, owner Donald and Brenda Andrews, applicant Forbes Brothers Limited. Uh, recommendation of the report, DES 2022-06, entitled Recommendation Report for Proposed Telecommunications Tower at 3447 Line 11 be received, and a council advise Innovation, Science, and Economic Development, ISED, Canada via Forbes Brothers Limited, that they concur with the proposal to install a telecommunications tower at the, at the property misbehaving known as 3447 line 11. May I get a mover and a second for this, please? Moved by Councillor Lamb, second by Councillor Contois. Questions or concerns with this one? 
we have a communication tower going to line 11. It always uh, it helps uh, increase our service levels throughout our community. All right, seeing none, all in favor? You, oh, did you have a question, Your Worship? Just a comment that this is quite close to uh, Joe McGanny Park uh, up by the 11th line and uh, just wondering whether uh, this will help with the internet, internet and cell phone uh, availability for those people that are at the park. And uh, I uh, think it's great that uh, this uh, tower is going there and it appears like there hasn't been any uh, any residents, neighbors uh, complaining, but uh, just wondering if, uh, if uh, that is a, an area that, that certainly needs to better service and uh, whether this is uh, uh, going to help that area as far as where the, the ball diamonds and soccer fields are. Next question, uh, I think it's Thomas, the, would Thomas be here or who would, uh, who would answer that for service level? Would I uh, pass that to Jeff, are you capable of? Uh, we promoted Alan oh. is uh, oh, on Alan. the file. Okay. Okay, Alan, go ahead. You're muted, Alan. Thank you, Deputy Mayor, my apologies. Uh, further to Mayor Kepper's question, uh, the short answer is yes. Uh, it is indeed anticipated to improve uh, wireless communication and also availability for uh, wireless internet customers in that immediate area. Excellent. So a, a better service level for our, our folks out in that area. That's, it'll even help our staff out there because uh, we've got our, our, our uh, line 11 uh, office out there. So it'll help everybody. Excellent, all right. Any further comments or questions with this report? Seeing none, all in favor? Carried, thank you. Moving on to 4.5, Report of uh, Development Engineering Services, Recommendation Report, Heritage Designation Bylaw, Woodhouse property address uh, 2659 line eight. Recommendation report DS 2022-04 entitled recommendation report heritage designation bylaw Woodhouse 2659 line eight be received and that the bylaw be enacted to designate 2659 line eight under section 29 of the Ontario Heritage Act ROS 1990 uh, section 18 as it is of cultural heritage value and interest. So this is a great opportunity for us to designate a home. So I need a move in a second for this. Move by Councilor Contra, second by Councilor Orr. Comments or questions with this one? This is a beautiful farm structure. Councilor Orr. Just a, a comment, uh, Deputy Mayor. And uh, this is uh, a house that definitely uh, uh, an asset to the community. And this is uh, uh, this recommendation has been in tandem with uh, uh, full cooperation of the people that own the property now and uh, recognize the significance of the, the home. Uh, they've agreed with the Heritage Committee that uh, um, that the, the barn, um, it was, uh, even though that had some significant heritage value, it was in not that great a shape and, and that the main uh, uh, agreement would be on the house. So that's, uh, we're fortunate that we've had uh, great uh, communication back and forth with the uh, owner and uh, we're looking forward to getting this on the designated list. Yes, great to see this come forward. Councilor Scott. It really is great to be able to preserve this house. I just wanted to ask about the pillars at the front of the driveway which I believe are on municipal property, not on uh, the line eight property that we're designating tonight. Does the municipality plan to preserve those pillars either in place or could we salvage them for some other use? Uh, Brandon, i turn it over to you. Uh, yes, uh, those pillars are on the town property. Uh, I'll uh, certainly make sure that the property owners know uh, just because there's sometimes confusion. Uh, but yeah, I'll, I'll certainly notify um, community services and the owner and uh, we'll see what we can do to make sure that they stay, stay part of the town's history in some way, shape or form. Yeah, good question, Dale Scott. I was going to ask the same thing about the pillars. They're wonderful pillars. We certainly want to maintain them. So I'm sure the Heritage Committee will speak with the owner of the property and uh, we can somehow figure out how we're going to make sure that they don't get knocked down or something or put somewhere where uh, they can add, add, uh, add uh, attributes to the house, even the farmhouse is there. So 
Great. Uh, Councilor Contra. No, good discussion, but I, I do believe a, a while back that uh, town had looked at putting a, a sidewalk on that side of the street. And I think those pillars were uh, uh, obstructing where the sidewalk needed to be. So that's probably why this conversation has come about. Um, anyways, I just thought I'd share that. Maybe I'm incorrect, but I, I'm pretty sure I remember that. No, you're absolutely correct. Uh, yeah. uh, Rebecca? Uh, certainly, the council uh, directed staff to install a temporary sidewalk, so there is a temporary connection there. Uh, the the pillars are on the in the right of way, and with the line eight reconstruction, they will certainly have to move. So uh, it is something that uh, community services will have to examine. They currently don't interfere with the existing temporary sidewalk, however, so they can stay there for a while. Excellent, good, good to hear. So, if any uh, further comments or questions on this one? All right, all in favor? Excellent, thank you. We have another one, uh, another designation here. We have the report of engineering services recommendation that the heritage designation bylaw Landerkin Page, is it, is it, did I say it right, Landerkin? Yeah, Landerkin Page House. Property address 4118 line six. Recommendation of the report DS 2022-03 entitled Recommendation Report Heritage Designation Bylaw Landerkin Page House at 4118 line six be received and that a bylaw be enacted to designate 4118 line six under section 29 of the Ontario Heritage Act ROS 1990 section 18 as it is of cultural value, uh, cultural heritage value and interest. Further comments are quite, oh, I need a mover and second, please. A mover and second for this. Do my Councillor Scott, second by Councillor Sandu. Uh, comments or questions on this one, Councillor Orr. Thank you, Deputy Mayor. Um, this is a good news one too, where the owners of the house have requested the designation. So the house has been uh, assessed and, uh, and felt that there is uh, definitely heritage value and uh, the owners uh, want to make sure that this house is uh, retained for in uh, perpetuity. So uh, we're, everybody's on board with this one. Yeah, that's really nice to see the owners come forward and, and you're absolutely right with the mud, mud block uh, construction, uh, 19, 1830s. So uh, a great, uh, great heritage value here for this one, for sure. So wonderful to see this. Further comments or questions on this one? All right, seeing none, all in favor? Carrie, thank you. And one more great report. Report of the Development Engineering Service Recommendation Report, Heritage Designation Bylaw, Earl Row Property. Property address 4304 to 4306, line 10. Recommendation of the report, DS 2022-05, entitled Recommendation Report, Heritage Designation Bylaw, Earl Row Property, 4304 to 4306, line 10, be received. And that a bylaw be enacted to designate 4304 to 4306, line 10, under section 29 of the Ontario Heritage Act, ROS 1990, Section 18, as it is of cultural uh, heritage, value, and interest. So I'm going to put this on the floor. Moved by Councillor Dyke, second by Councillor Orr. This is a great report. I just, I couldn't get to the end of it. Every time I went and I uh, wanted to see the uh, the pictures and, and some of the stuff at the end and the report, the AR, AR, uh, ARA report, I, I would, it would, click out on me, I'd lose it on my uh, thing. So Brandon sent me it the, today and I appreciate that. So I got to I got to go through a little bit further, but uh, yeah, great report. So comments or questions and Councillor Orr, we'll leave it off with you again. Yes, this has been a long uh, standing uh, uh, request for the town to look into this and, uh, and the Heritage Committee. Uh, and uh, I have to commend uh, Brandon for his work on this with the owners. Uh, it's been over a, a few years now talking and, and their report and our report. And, and uh, maybe Brandon, uh, you'd like to make a few comments on, on how this has progressed and, and where we are now. Yeah, sure. Um, yeah, this, this one uh, took some time to get there. Uh, a lot of back and forth, uh, but both ourselves and the owner and his team I managed to get to a place where we were both happy with what is being uh, designated. Uh, the, own, the owner um, and his consult consultants really, as they learn more and more about the property, they learn of uh, its importance. It's really uh, a cool property and really captures a special uh, place in time 
Uh, it's a fantastic property. It was owned by the Honorable Earl Rowe, who was the Lieutenant Governor, uh, Lieutenant Governor in the province or even the county, and really has a big history and presence in the horse racing and uh, horse breeding community. This is really uh, an important property and uh, and I, I'm just a whole cross section. So yeah, this was one that uh, we, we had to make sure we did right uh, and we'll continue to work with the property owner moving forward. Yeah, this one was a great one. And I think it, I think you said something a pretty good, Brandon, it, educating the new owner of the property and about Earl Rowe himself and, and the real historic value to that. So uh, this, is a, this is a wonderful one to get through and it's been a while coming. So Councillor, uh, or, sorry, Mayor Keffer. <laughs> Thank you, Deputy Mayor, and uh, yeah, big uh, thank you to Brandon and his team for uh, uh, working through this and working with the owner of the property because it is significant. Not only is the house designated, but to my understanding, the U-shaped barn as well, uh, two detached farmstead outbuildings, uh, as well as the mature trees and vegetation that frame the farmstead complex. So. Uh, that is right, Brandon, that those are all part of the uh, significant features. So to be able to get the barns, uh, outbuildings, the well, the water well, uh, to be uh, all included, that uh, that is a, a great achievement. So that, uh, as Brandon has said, we'll have to continue to work with the owners, the property owners, to, uh, to uh, make sure that we... Uh, yeah, you know, do keep this property uh, uh, looking up and something that our community can be proud of. So anyways, just a, a thank you to Brandon and the, and the whole team for uh, bringing this forward. Yes, well said. Uh, yeah, very significant property. Love to, love to see this one. There's lots of history there, so. Excellent, so any further comments or questions on this? Councilor Lamb. Just briefly, um, yeah, I, I'm really hoping they can save it all because uh, it um, it needs a bit of work. So we need to work with with the owners on that. Uh, I just also like to point out that the uh, Newton Robinson School, uh, which is on 27 in Newton Robinson, uh, appears to be uh, taken off this farm. Uh, somewhere hundreds of years ago or a couple hundred years ago when they were trying to uh, to have a, a public school and it's it's on that property as well and it's it's quite a building itself uh, if somebody ever looks when you drive up there I know it's not designated but uh, it's an interesting uh, structure with um, uh, you know separation for entrances for boys and girls and such like that that they had in the 1800s so uh, uh, Newton Robinson was quite a little community at the time and uh, also I was talking to a fellow in Cookstown a number of years ago uh, and uh, he's quite the historian up there and he was telling me that that post office in, uh, in, uh, in Newton Robinson was the busiest one in rural Ontario because all of uh, the Lieutenant Governor's business went through that post office, uh, political and mining. So uh, it was an interesting area. And Bob Pulford was born in Newton Robinson. Anyway, thanks. Excellent. So I, I just got a message from Councilor here. He's got to log off. So we uh, we are sorry and we appreciate you letting us know. So we'll see you. Thank you, uh, Councilor Sandu. All right. So uh, let's. Oh, he went. I was just going to try and get the vote while he was here. So, anyways, we'll uh, we'll vote on the four point seven. All in favor of the Earl property? Excellent. Thank you. Thank you, Brandon. Uh, where am I, Emmett? Yes, 4.8, 4.8, Report of Finance Department, the 2022 cost sharing update and 2022 budget for the Bradford, West Columbury, Innisfil Police Service Board. So report that, uh, that report FIN 2022-01 entitled 2022 cost sharing update and 2022 budget for the Bradford, West Columbury, Innisfil Police Service Board be received that the 2022 cost sharing update for Bradford West Glenbury Innisfil Police Service Board be received, that a bylaw to amend the 1996 Police Service 
police services amalgamation agreement be considered at the next council meeting or the next meeting of council that the 2022 Bradford West Bloomberg Innisfil Police Service Board operating budget of $22,165,550 net of court security and prisoner transportation grant and capital budget of 780,637 be approved and that the town's 10,089,691 share of the police services police board's 2022 budget plus the town's direct self division facility costs of 125,000 be funded with 105,257 of court security and prisoner transportation grant revenue, $230,650 from the uh, police capital expenditure reserve fund, $159,669 from the town's tax rate stabilization reserves and a $10,295,692 property tax levy. Move in a second for this, please. To put it on the floor. Councillor Lamb, second by His Worship. Comments or questions on this uh, this budget? We've been dealing with it for a while. They they report it back to us. We're just doing some finalizing with it, and it's uh it's how we're funding the budget. It's our yearly thing that we fund. Seeing no comments or questions. All in favor? Carried. Thank you. Moving on to report of finance department 2022 COVID supports for affected small business report a uh, recommendation that report FIN 2022-02 entitled 2022 COVID supports for affected small business be approved and the council approve a scoped application based COVID relief program for affected businesses to provide temporary relief from late payment penalties and interest as outlined in this report. Move a second to put this on the floor, please. By Councillor Ferragini, seconded by His Worship. Comments or questions on this? Uh, we're back into another lockdown, so um, we have some programs out there that the, the provincial government has uh, has initiated. And uh, in this report, we see that we want to uh, help out and when we can, whatever it is. So, uh, Your Worship. Yes, thank you, Deputy Mayor. So that uh, yes, unfortunately, when the provincial government announced the uh, new measures, we're back to uh, a type of uh, stage two lockdown that it's pretty hard on our business community, our small businesses, our restaurants, our uh, gyms, and uh, even our personal uh, care facilities that are down to 50%. And it is, uh, I guess I would say that I did ask uh, our CAO if he could uh, have a report come to our next council meeting just to give a, uh, an overall uh, summary of what the federal government and the provincial government is doing as far as helping out the small businesses. And uh, as you see in the report, actually uh, they're stepping up or the provincial government is stepping up pretty good. They have a $10,000 grant that will help the, uh, the uh, small businesses affected if they uh, fall into a certain criteria. They do have a, a, a certain uh, uh, criteria that they will help to pay for energy costs and property taxes for certain businesses that, that meet the criteria. So that it's good to see that, but uh, I think the town of Bradford, West Bloomberg ha has stepped up and, and uh, when the pandemic first hit uh, almost two years ago that uh, we were one of the first municipalities that did have a, uh, a grant program for our small businesses that uh, we used $250,000 uh, to be able to uh, give uh, grants of up to $5,000 to our, our small businesses. And then as well that we did allow deferral of some property taxes, water bills, and uh, no penalty or interest. So I think the report uh, uh, lays out quite well that uh, we don't have to probably do, uh, do as much as what we have done in the past but there is a, a recommendation here, and I think that uh, it uh, will certainly uh, uh, help uh, a few businesses as well. They have to meet a certain criteria. They have to either be shut down during this lockdown period or be uh, restricted to 50% of their occupancy. And what it is, is uh, no penalty or interest up to a certain date if they're not able to pay their property taxes. And uh, 
I, I think it's uh, it's the uh, the optics of uh, cash flow. Uh, if they can't pay their property taxes, if we're going to charge them uh, a penalty, that that's just something that's too hard for them to to take uh, with everything else that's going on to our small businesses. So so I think it's it, it it's something. It won't cost the municipality a lot of money to be able to do that to be able to uh, show that uh, we do uh, uh, feel for our small businesses and the cash flow problems that they do have. And that, uh, so uh, that's why uh, I, I uh, support the, the recommendation that we do have in this, uh, in this report. And that uh, I think it, it will show that uh, we are, uh, are willing to, to help out the small businesses that, that, uh, do need the help and do have a cash flow problem. So thank you, Deputy Mayor. No, thank you, Worship. And yes, you're absolutely right. Uh, want to, I want to thank staff for bringing that forward. It was a quick turnaround for them. Uh, they brought this to our first council meeting and you're absolutely right. We've stepped up in the past and uh, it was incumbent upon us to do it again. And we found a, we found a way to, to hopefully uh, help our small business uh, community, at least give them an opportunity uh, if, they're, if they're struggling to pay their bills, that they have some uh, no penalties or, or interest uh, incurred in that because they're already struggling to start with. So uh, great great for us to do that again. And I hope, uh, I hope the, we don't have that to come up. I hope a lot of businesses can, can carry on and do their, do their uh, pay their property tax, things like that. But we're there for them and we want to be there for them and show our support for a small business throughout our, our community. It's a, been a tough time when you're in your fourth lockdown. It's a, it's pretty hard. And I'm sure uh, um, Councillor Dykey and others understand uh, about the small business aspect and how, uh, how impactful it's been to everybody throughout uh, Ontario and especially with our community. So nice to see our staff turn this around and, and bring that opportunity for us. And I certainly support this. Uh, absolutely. Like Mayor Kepper said, we're, I, I support the recognition that the staff has written. Further uh, comments or questions on this? All right, seeing none, all in favor? Carried, thank you. Moving on to uh, 4.10. Report of Corporate Services, 2022 Municipal Election, General Election Matters. Recognition that report COR 2022-02 regarding the 2022 Municipal Election, General Election Matters be received and the council confirms the following with respect to the 2022 Municipal Election. That English will be used for all notices and forms with the exception of those pertaining to the French language school boards in which English and French will be used as per the Municipal Elections Act and that a recount policy is not necessary at this time as the provisions with respect to recounts under the Municipal Elections Act are sufficient and that a, that a campaign contribution rebate program not be implemented for the 2022 Municipal Election. Move in a second to put this on the floor for discussion. Councillor Orr, second by Councillor Lamb. Comments or questions with this report? It's about the 2022 municipal election. Uh, that could be contributions, not giving back contributions. It talks about uh, we wouldn't be able to give back uh, contributions to, uh, to people that ran if we want to, but we haven't done it in the past. There's only a few municipalities that do that. It's the larger municipalities to create uh, opportunities for other people to run. So uh, we're not in that category. So don't see any need for that. Seeing any comments or questions? None, all right. All in favor? Thank you. All right, rise and report. Recommendation that the committee of whole adjourn at 9.08. Move or second for that, please. Move by Councillor Dyke, second by Councillor Contois. All in favor? Carried, thank you. We turn it back to you, Your Worship. Thank you, Deputy Mayor. So I'll reconvene the regular council meeting at 9.09. So, we're on to item 12, committee minutes and recommendations. So 12.1, Heritage Committee minutes. So the recommendation is that the minutes of the December 16th, 2021 Heritage Committee meeting be received. Mover and a seconder for this. Councillor Orr, Councillor Contois, comments or questions? Seeing none, I'll call for the vote. All those in favor? Any opposed? It is carried. 12.2 Accessibility Advisory Committee Minutes, January the 6th, 2022. So the recommendation is that the minutes of the January 6, 2022 Accessibility Advisory Committee meeting be received. Mover and a seconder for this. Deputy Mayor LeDuc, Councillor Scott, 
comments or questions? Seeing none, I'll call for the vote. All in favor? And it is carried. Recommendation, the council request staff report on the feasibility of instituting a concession fare on BWG Transit, such as the Transit Assistant Program, TAP, offered by York, York Region Transit. Mover and a seconder for this. Deputy Mayor LeDuc, Councilor Dykey, comments or questions? Deputy Mayor? Yeah, it's, it's a program that York Region has is to assist with uh, uh, people with disabilities. It's a, a reduced fare for them. Um, we were looking for the county to help us out with that through the links program, but the county uh, is going through some changes uh, with the uh, management structure. So it was a little bit uh, uh, cumbersome at this time. So we decided that we would uh, ask for staff to come back to the report to see if we can assist with uh, some people with disabilities to uh, have a reduced fare to get from Bradford to the go or to, uh, uh, yeah, to the go and then pick up York from there. But just it's just a small program. Uh, um, so we're just, just a little bit asking staff to give us a report back on that. Thank you. Thank you, Deputy Mayor. Sounds like a good program. So with that, I'll call for the vote. All those in favor? Any opposed? And it is carried. So the recommendation is that report COR 2022-01 be received and the council endorse the multi-year accessibility plan for 2020 to 2025 as amended and the 2021 accessibility status report and that both reports be published on the town of BWG's website. Mover and a seconder for this. Councillor Scott, Councillor Ferragini, comments or questions? I think that uh, Deputy Mayor, do you want to comment that this is uh, something that uh, we have to do every year? We do have the accessibility uh, uh, plan in place and that uh, it, uh, a few changes. So Deputy Mayor. Yeah, every year we uh, we look at the plan uh, um, at this time it's Valerie that uh, is our committee coordinator right now and we review the committee reviews the plan and we uh, we make some minor changes to it it's a five-year plan that we, we uh, created in 2020 uh, we just have to review it every year and move it forward as a as a committee with accessibility over 10,000 you have to have the committee and you have to have your plan in place and uh, we just update it every year and in 2025 we'll review the whole plan again and do a, a complete full new plan for it but uh, it's, a, it's a yearly process that we go through and the committee has to just chalk off the things that we've added to the plan and created a new opportunity. So um, it's, a, it's, a good, it's a good review of the plan just to make sure that we're on target and doing what we want to do to, to uh, make sure that we meet the legislative requirements of uh, AODA for, uh, for the province of Ontario. Thank you. Yes, thanks, Deputy Mayor. Just reading the report, it is quite extensive uh, and it is a good exercise, as you say, to, to make sure that we have enough accessible parking spots in the commercial areas and, and town facilities and that and uh, sidewalks and curbs and things like that that are are looked at every year so with that i'll call for the vote all those in favor and it is carried 12.3 anti-racism advisory committee so the recommendation is that the minutes of the January 10th, 2022 Anti-Racism Advisory Committee meeting be received. A mover and a seconder for this. Councillor Lamb, Councillor Dykey, comments or questions? Seeing none, I'll call the vote. All in favor? And it is carried. So recommendation that council direct staff to supplement the anti-racism action plan with a plan for collection of Disaggregated race-based data in coordination with system complete service and local school boards and propose an analytical framework to use such data to better understand and address possible inequities faced by racialized residents. Moving to seconder for this, Councillor Scott, uh, Councillor Ferragini, comments or questions, uh, Councillor Scott. Thanks, Your Worship. I'll just briefly speak to this to say that uh, I don't have lived experience in these issues, but those who do and experts in anti-racism work say it's imperative that we collect data that shows us uh, in an anonymous way how uh, race and ethnicity can impact services in the public sector. And uh, having that data allows us to see where there may or may not be barriers 
in that anonymized way. And then we can make uh, changes to our, our policies and procedures accordingly. The library already has done some of this uh, in our municipality, and that's uh, partly what led to eliminating late fines and the move to eliminate programming fees because there was a sense that uh, racialized youth were facing barriers to accessing the library. It's certainly uh, really the foundation of Ontario's Anti-Racism Act to have this uh, data collection. And so the motion proposes that our staff uh, begin to plan how we could do this in Bradford and that we would uh, coordinate with South Simcoe Police and the school board as well, uh, both of whom have some uh, efforts in this regard already underway. But uh, I certainly think it's an important first step for the Anti-Racism Committee uh, we had a good meeting to start the new year. And one of the main themes of that meeting was how the committee could have its action plan and its mission. Uh, and and the, the belief was starting with uh, having the data collection would give us the evidence we need to take better decisions. Thanks, Councillor Scott. Well said that uh, I think it, uh, it it is asking for a staff report. So I, I think staff will have to delve fairly deep into uh, the proper process and procedure to do this. Uh, that, uh, but as Councillor Scott said, uh, uh, the school board is already doing uh, some of this. Uh, there was a report in Bradford today about uh, uh what the school board is doing and that uh and uh yeah to be able to get buy-in uh from uh from the residents to be able to uh to realize that this is anonymous information that is going to uh, uh be used to, to, to analyze and and make sure that uh, there aren't barriers to certain segments of our our community so that uh, any further comments? With that, I'll call for the vote. All those in favor? Any opposed? It is carried. The next recommendation is that council direct staff to amend the town's naming policy such that racial, ethnic, and gender diversity be criteria and that the list of potential street names be updated accordingly. Mover and a seconder for this. Councillor Scott, Councillor Dykey, comments or questions? Councillor Scott? This was also something that passed unanimously at the committee. Basically, it's uh, asking that we take a look at our, our naming policies so that diversity in, in its various forms can be a criteria. I think we'd all agree that we uh, want to honor uh, those who have contributed to town, but I think it's also fair to say that right now, most of the street names in town are uh, are European and often named after male residents and uh, diversifying that would be a, a nice way to show um, our respect for uh, women, uh, people of various ethnicities, uh, even those who might be differently abled. And I, I also think it could let us uh, uh, honor some of our indigenous past and present reality in this community. So uh, hopefully this is a nice uh, thing to add into our naming policy. and. Uh, I'll also just say it's, it's sort of the positive spin on the debate you hear about street names. Uh, we want to try and honor uh, more diverse groups of people, uh, not get into a debate necessarily about our history. We want to make sure our history is inclusive of, uh, of all people uh, who uh, might be excluded today. Further comments, Councillor Lamb? I know I shouldn't, but I agree with what Jonathan's saying. However, uh, my concern is there's lots of clickbait out there, lots of bots, uh, you know, sending all kinds of stuff over the internet uh, and not even necessarily uh, uh, pertinent to us uh, from other countries or whatever we're seeing in, in uh, uh, you know, on television or whatever. We have um, here, and, and you, did, uh, you did mention uh, Indigenous, uh, uh, this was a historic area, and, and we need to do more of uh, recognizing that. We also need to do more of recognizing all the groups. And I understand you use the word European. However, uh, if you look at the Holland Marsh, the Holland Marsh has attracted all kinds of people that came from uh, uh, revolutions or, or uh, starvation or wherever, and they came here for, or floods or whatever came here for opportunity. And the same thing's happening today. 
Um, so I believe that uh, if we do that, we need to still maintain historical perspective. Uh, however, um, uh, we also need to ensure that what we're doing is made in Bradford, West Willembury, um, because I'm not certain I need to, well, I, I don't even wanna go anywhere with this. I'm just simply saying is that we're all human beings. We all share DNA um, and uh, we are here and uh, we need to make the best of the situation and include everybody. And that, that's what I'm gonna say here. I just, what I don't wanna have is somebody being excluded because of uh, uh, some historical perspective. Uh, whereas, uh, you know, we're all, trying, we're all trying to live together here. Uh, and anybody can call me if they misunderstand what, uh, what I'm trying to say, but I believe that you should be proud, proud of where you came from and proud of who you are, no matter who you are and where you come from. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Lamb. Councillor Fergini. Thank you, Worship. Um, from my understanding, the town has uh, the list that we have for potential um, street naming. Uh, so the, the developers can look at that list and anybody, doesn't matter who you are, can send a recommendation to the town as to why or, or the name you want to use and as to why you want to use it and the town can put that on the list. So. I always felt that this was open to anybody and everybody. I see this as just being more of a, um, I guess, promotion that it is open to everybody just to, just to make you fully aware that it's open to everybody. It's open to everybody and anybody. And when the street naming comes to council or if uh, there's a developer putting their subdivision together, they're still gonna look through the names, they're still gonna choose, and it's still gonna fit uh, the criteria and it's gotta work with our town. That's, that's just the way I look at it. I mean, we are an all-inclusive town and, you know, the, the stories that we have from the past in this town are great. And uh, if it fits in the recommend, if it fits in the criteria, then so be it. I just look at it as kind of just putting it on, um, like, um, just promoting that it is for everybody and anybody to put their name forward for it. Thank you, Councilor Ferragini. Any further comments, questions? Seeing none, I'll call for the vote then. All those in favor? Any opposed? And it is carried. Recommendation of Council Direct Staff to outline a plan to pursue the United Nations Education, Science and Culture Organizations Inclusive Municipalities designation. Mover and a seconder for this. And Councillor Scott, Deputy Mayor LaDuke, comments or questions? That uh, this is uh, a designation that uh, I think we should work towards. Uh, that uh, I think maybe, uh, you know, we could have a report at the next anti racism or one of the anti racism advisory committee me meetings just to uh, lay out. Uh, what is necessary, how far we are along in that process. And, and it would be a, a nice goal for this committee to, to be able to strive to, uh, to reach. So with that, I'll call for the vote. All those in favor? And it is carried. So item 13, new business. There's no new business, so bylaws. Bylaw 2022-01, a bylaw to establish part of a public highway, Yonkman Boulevard. Bylaw 2022-02, a bylaw to amend bylaw 2020-75, a bylaw to establish a heritage property tax rebate program to provide tax rebates in respect of eligible heritage property under the Municipal Act SO 2001, Chapter 25, Section 365.2 as amended and bylaw 2022-03, a bylaw to appoint a deputy chief building official, Yancey Ambig. So the recommendation is that bylaws 2022 01, 2022 02, and 2022 03 be enacted. Mover and a seconder for this. Councillor Conta, Councillor Orr, comments and questions? Seeing none, a call for the vote. All in favor? And it is carried. 
Announcements? Are there any announcements? I don't think we do have a slide to show it people, but uh, I'd like to thank our staff for having the outdoor uh, skating rinks uh, up and going this last week and uh, a bit of snow to, to shovel off, but I noticed in Bondhead there was people skating on the this afternoon that they did get the, the snow cleared off uh, the rink and bond head. Um, other announcements that uh, Councillor Scott? I don't want to preempt their ability to announce it, but I wanted to just uh, pay tribute to the food bank. Uh, they are now serving between 900 and 1,000 people per month uh, with the cost of food and the pandemic. Uh, it's really been an increasing need and uh, people really stepped up. They'll be announcing their year end fundraising totals and their uh, the total number of donated goods and the value that is assigned to it. And it's a uh, it's the most ever uh, by a long shot. It's a substantial amount that they fundraised last year, uh, thanks to uh, nearly 800 uh, donors from families, businesses, faith groups in the municipality. So. I think they'll be announcing the, the grand total later this week, but it's a, it's a huge achievement that um, without, without spoiling their announcement, I think I can say uh, it won't be long before it's a million dollar a year enterprise. And so uh, between the food donated and the cash donated, they're, um, they're really providing a huge service and it's thanks to the support of the community. Thank you, Councillor Scott, and thank you for your work on the Food Bank Committee. Any other announcements that uh, Deputy Mayor? Uh, just here, we just announced that the uh, county is now open for taking, uh, for changing your, your uh, garbage bins. It is uh, open to residents if they want to uh, change the size of the garbage bin. So not that there's going to be a quick uh, turnover of it, but at least you can get in the system and register and get yourself uh, ready for um, um, changing your bins from whatever size. So it's open uh, now and it'll probably happen sometime in March when they do it, but <laughs> just letting them know. Yes, thanks Deputy Mayor. But, uh, any other comments? I guess um, just COVID vaccination clinics and uh, it, it appears there are walk-ins available uh, at the clinics that uh, it, uh, Anyways, uh, just if we can tell our residents to, to look at uh, social media to see, uh, see when and where they are and uh, what the opportunities are for walk-in uh, for vaccines. So that uh, with that, we'll move on. Are there any notices of motions? Seeing none, confirm proceedings. Recommendation that bylaw 2022-04, bylaw to confirm proceedings of the council meeting dated January the 18th, 2022, be enacted. Mover and a seconder for this. Councillor Contois, Councillor Ferragini, all in favor. It is carried. An adjournment recommendation that the meeting is hereby adjourned at uh, 9.30. Mover and a seconder for this. Councillor Scott, Councillor Dykey, all in favor.